and welcome to Relevant History. I'm Dan Toller. Today's episode is the finale of a five-part sequence on the American Revolution. If you're new to the show and want to start at the beginning, I would recommend skipping back to episode 52, An Accidental Revolution. For everybody else, here we go. And just a bit of housekeeping before we begin. Uh, this episode ran longer than I thought it would, and that has delayed production on my June Patreon video. Uh, to get things back in line, I will be doing two Patreon videos in July, and for the main show, the one you're listening to right now, I will be taking a short pseudo-break. And I say pseudo break because I do have another bonus episode just about ready to record that will drop next month. It'll just be shorter than a regular episode and a bit off the beaten path. Uh, this will also give me a full month to prepare notes for August's episode, which will kick off our next sequence of episodes on the French Revolution. Also, you may or may not hear some political advertising during this episode. Podbean, my hosting service, has started to offer that option to podcasters, and I have opted into their pilot program. Not everyone will hear these ads, and to be honest, I'm not sure how Podbean decides who does and doesn't get them, since their delivery of regular ads is already kind of a random mystery box. I have zero control over the content of the ads, I have zero control over which candidates are running them, and I have zero control over what causes they are supporting. I hope that is sufficient disclaimer. And I am also hoping that they won't be too intrusive, since... I don't want to ruin your listening experience. I'm just trying to earn a few dollars from this show here. Uh, and if it gets to the point where it's a problem, I can and will turn political ads off. But I'm confident that you guys are smart enough to tell the difference between what I'm saying and whatever someone in an ad is blathering about. And if this does become intrusive for you, or if you want to get in touch with me about anything else send me an email at dantollerpodcast at gmail.com. That's dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast at gmail.com. I will definitely be taking feedback into account. Now, at long last, let us get to the end of the American Revolution. When we... Wrapped up last episode, in February of 1782, the British Parliament votes to end hostilities with the United States. The Empire at this time is under intense pressure from the French and the Spanish, and it needs all of its fleets and armies to fight those two other world-spanning empires. At the same time, the United States has pledged to France that there will be no separate peace with the British. And the French have made a similar pledge to the Spanish, so for the time being, the United States and the British Empire remain officially at war without doing much actual fighting. In fact, the British give up on their southern campaign altogether and withdraw their troops from Charleston, South Carolina, as they are no longer needed there. The evacuation officially begins on December 14, 1782. Along with 5,000 redcoats, an eclectic mix of black and white South Carolinians also crowd the docks. The 5,000 or so black people are freedmen. They are liberated slaves who have been promised sanctuary by the British. After the evacuation, some will settle in Canada, while others will seek their fortunes in the Caribbean, and still others will return to Africa to found their own colony in Sierra Leone. 
the 4,200 or so European descended people are loyalist citizens who are fleeing elsewhere in the British Empire again, most of them to Canada. Of these citizens, uh, 500 have actually been sentenced to death by the South Carolina State Assembly, so they really want to get out of there. And credit to the Royal Navy, they pull off the evacuation without a hitch, using 130 ships to evacuate all 14,000 or so people and not leaving a single soul behind. This leaves the last major garrison of British troops in the United States in Manhattan. These troops are commanded by Sir Guy Carleton, who has taken over as commander-in-chief in North America in May of 1782, replacing Henry Clinton in the increasingly thankless job. And basically... Their role at this point is to maintain a British presence in North America to remind the Americans that they're still technically at war and to ensure the protection of Loyalist citizens. Maybe if things start going better against the French and the Spanish, they can even go on the offensive again. But for the time being, they are just there to keep an eye on the Loyalists and maintain some sort of presence. The Continental Congress, meanwhile, is unable to continue funding the Continental Army when there is little active fighting. George Washington takes up a position outside of New York to keep an eye on the British, but almost all of his soldiers are sent home on furlough. In the South, most of Nathaniel Greene's men have gone home as soon as the British withdrew from Charleston, assuming that the war is over. The only men remaining on payroll are Washington's officers, and even they are kept on at half pay. Unless the British launch a new North American offensive, the United States is out of the war. It's an odd position to be in during your own revolution, but that's just how things go sometimes. This U.S. and Britain are at peace, though. Instead, the situation is more of an uneasy truce with sporadic low-level outbreaks of violence. So, before we talk about how the war finally ends, let's talk about what's going on in the colonies. And the first part of this is a diplomatic incident that threatens to reignite active fighting between the Americans and the British. And this is called the Askill Affair. The Askill Affair begins with a dispute over the treatment of prisoners of war. You may remember that at the end of the Saratoga campaign, the British prisoners were first to be paroled back to Great Britain, but that General Burgoyne refused to hand over a list of his troops' names, so Congress reneged on the deal and kept those men prisoner. Well, under 18th century rules of war, Prisoners are to be paid for by the country that they were fighting for. So basically, Congress is supposed to tally up their costs for caring for these prisoners and send Parliament a bill. This is one of those things that's tough to get your head around as a modern person because we don't see war as some kind of civilized endeavor. For us, war is what happens when we run out of civilized ways to solve our problems. Anyway... The system breaks down in this case because the British refuse to pay for prisoners that both General Clinton and Parliament insist are supposed to have been paroled. Congress also refuses to pay for the prisoners, which puts George Washington in a bind. He can't let them go, but he also barely has enough money to feed and house his own troops. So, he comes up with the idea of leasing the prisoners out as hired labor to Patriot landowners. Many of these soldiers are German-speaking, and there's a large German-speaking minority in the United States at this time, so as soon as they get the chance, most of these people just slip off into the countryside and assimilate with the local German population. Even so, 
The fact that prisoners of war are being used as forced labor at all does not go down well with the British public. At the same time, British treatment of American prisoners of war is also deplorable. While American soldiers are housed in humane conditions uh, after being captured, captured American sailors are held in squalid prison ships anchored in Wallabout Bay between Brooklyn and Manhattan. Conditions are so bad that every morning the British jailers open the ship's hatches and shout, Rebels, turn out your dead! and then they dispose of any corpses. Between disease and malnutrition, more Americans die on these prison ships than are killed in combat in the entire war. And this, in turn, has created some simmering resentment amongst the American public about the treatment of their prisoners. And as a result, Generals Clinton and Washington spill a lot of ink trying to negotiate a prisoner exchange. This comes to a head in the spring of 1782. American historian William F. Fowler writes about it in his book, An American Crisis, George Washington and the Dangerous Two Years After Yorktown, 1781 through 1783. And before I read this quote, I should mention that when Fowler writes about Franklin, He's not talking about the founding father, Benjamin Franklin. He's talking about Benjamin Franklin's illegitimate son, William Franklin, who is the former governor of New Jersey and a major loyalist leader, and who will ultimately emigrate to Britain when the war is over. Anyway, Fowler writes, quote, The crisis began on the evening of March 28, 1782 when a gang of New York loyalists led by Philip White set out from New York City to raid the New Jersey coast. They landed at Sandy Hook and then made their way farther down the coast to Long Branch, where a band of local Patriot vigilantes, the Monmouth Retaliators, surprised them and captured White. The Retaliators set their prisoner on a horse and headed toward the town of Freehold about 15 miles inland. A few miles down the road, White leapt off the horse and dashed for nearby woods. One of the American guards fired and hit him in the back, but White showed no sign of stopping. As he crawled toward the wood line, a horseman drew his saber and rode at him, calling furiously, Give up! You shall have good quarters yet! Ignoring the order, White continued towards the trees. The horseman closed and slashed him to death. When news of White's savage death, he was, after all, wounded and unarmed, reached New York City, loyalists screamed for revenge. White's murder, they argued, was only the most recent atrocity committed by the Monmouth retaliators, whom they accused of murdering a number of the king's loyal subjects. Retaliation was long overdue. They pressed Clinton to release to them a rebel prisoner for execution. When he reacted coolly to their demand, with Governor Franklin's encouragement, they began to plot their own revenge. The plan's architect was Captain Richard Lippincott, a member of the Associated Loyalists and the late Philip White's brother-in-law. Like Franklin, Lippincott was a New Jersey Loyalist who early in the war had been imprisoned and driven from his home. He fled to New York and became an officer in a Loyalist regiment. On the morning of April 9th, less than two weeks after White's death, Lippincott, with several other Loyalist soldiers, presented himself to the provost's guard at the prison where a number of Americans were being held. He was accompanied by Walter Chalonet, the commissary of prisoners. Chalonet ordered the jailers to turn over three Americans to Lippincott one of them Captain Joshua Huddy, a leader of the Monmouth Regulators who was notorious for his boast that he hanged the loyalist Stephen Edwards. I tied the knot and greased the rope, he said. Under what authority Chalonet and Lippincott were operating remains shrouded, although at several points Governor Franklin's name was invoked. In any case, 
Lippincott removed the three prisoners to the guard ship Britannia. Eventually, two of the prisoners were released, but not Huddy. After three days confined aboard the Britannia, on April 12th, Lippincott brought Huddy to Navin Sink Hills on the Jersey Shore near the Hook. Lippincott stood Huddy up on a barrel, placed a rope around his neck, and pinned a sign to his chest proclaiming, Up goes Huddy for Philip White, and then shook his hand. As Huddy proclaimed his innocence, a Negro executioner kicked the barrel away. During the American Revolutions, burnings, lootings, and even murder, particularly where irregular forces were involved, were not rare. Huddy's brutal death, especially spectacular in public, brought a flood of demands for retaliation. Pressed to act, Washington ordered a campaign on April 19th. Washington was not present, but through General Heath, who presided, he placed three questions before the council. Shall there be retaliation for the murder of Captain Huddy? On whom shall it be inflicted? And how shall the victim be designated? By secret ballot, the officers voted unanimously to take retaliation, and that it should be inflicted on an officer of equal rank, the a captain, not under convention or capitulation, but one that had surrendered at discretion, and that in designating such a one, it should be done by lot. Hanging a British captain gave Washington pause, and so he wrote to Clinton, To save the innocent, I demand the guilty. Lippincott, Washington demanded, must be turned over. If not, retaliation would follow. Despite Washington's rhetoric, and Clinton's claim that he was greatly surprised and shocked at the behavior of the associated loyalists, neither side could claim much virtue in this matter. Philip White, an escaping prisoner, had been wounded and then cut down by a saber-wielding American trooper. Without the slightest nod to a legal proceeding, Joshua Huddy had been executed in an act of vengeance. To Clinton, whose main preoccupation by this time was salvaging his reputation, the behavior of the loyalist banditti was another potential blot on his command. He described the associated loyalists as an obnoxious institution, and their behavior as an audacious breach of humanity and an insult to the dignity of British arms. What they had done was reprehensible. Clinton was convinced that the Loyalists, under Franklin's direction, were involved in a plot to involve the Navy and Army in the guilt for the purpose of exciting the war of indiscriminate retaliation which they appear to have long thirsted after. Clinton held Franklin responsible. At the very moment when he was trying to negotiate a prisoner exchange and avoid confrontation with Washington, by this barbarous act, the governor and his friends had upended his plans. They had committed a heinous crime, for which Clinton was convinced his enemies in America and England would hold him accountable. Clinton could barely wait to hand the mess over to Carleton. On April 26th, Clinton brought the matter before a council of officers. Following their advice, he ordered Lippincott arrested and held for a general court-martial. Franklin protested vigorously, arguing that Lippincott was a civilian over whom the military had no authority. Clinton rejected Franklin's claim. Refusing Washington's demand that Lippincott be turned over to him, Clinton ordered a court-martial. On May 1, 1782, a court of 16 officers, with General James Robertson presiding, convened to hear the case. Washington reacted quickly. He ordered Brigadier General Moses Hazen, commanding the enemy prisoner cap at Lancaster, to select by lot a British officer to be sent immediately to Philadelphia. In the instruction, Washington specifically noted that the officer chosen had to be an unconditional prisoner. That is, an officer taken on the field of battle who surrendered without conditions. Since all of the prisoners at Lancaster had been taken conditionally through a negotiated surrender, how Hazen was to find such an officer was unclear. He could not, and two weeks later, 
Washington ordered Hazen to disregard the written pledges that had been made at Saratoga and Yorktown and find a captain for retaliation. Washington's reasoning is difficult to fathom. Ordinarily, he had been inclined to leave matters related to local partisan warfare in the hands of civil authorities. Irregulars were often not under his control, and he made this point during negotiations with Cornwallis. Loyalists serving under British arms had to answer to civil authorities. With Washington's order in hand, Hazen, who, ironically, early in the war had himself been a prisoner of the British, arrived at Lancaster. He had an unhappy task. On the morning of May 27th, he assembled all the camp's captains and announced to them that they were to choose by lot from their number a captain to be hanged if General Clinton did not turn over Lippincott. Moses Hazen was a professional soldier, and so were the British officers who stood in line at Lancaster to draw lots. Neither Hazen nor the captains had been party to the unlawful events in New Jersey, and both condemned them. Neither was comfortable with what was about to take place. Solemnly, the British officers drew straws. The unfortunate lot fell on Captain Charles Askill of the Guards, a young gentleman of 17 years of age, the only son of Sir Charles Asgill, baronet, heir to an extensive fortune and an honorable title. Hazen reported to Washington that the British officers were enraged at Sir Henry Clinton for not bringing the Loyalists to heel, and for leaving the officers to suffer for the sins of the guilty. It was, wrote Hazen, a disagreeable situation. Hazen and Asgill left for Philadelphia accompanied by Asgill's friend Captain Ludlow, who carried a letter from Major James Gordon, the ranking British officer at Lancaster, to Secretary Lincoln. Gordon minced no words. He pointed out to Lincoln that Lippincott and his men, who called themselves refugees, were no better than banditti. They were not part of His Majesty's regular forces. They had lynched poor Huddy, was regrettable, but that such a violent and illegal act should lead to another unconscionable act, an ignominious death for Asgill, was equally outrageous. The young captain was innocent of any offense, and furthermore, wrote the major, he was protected by Article 14 of the Yorktown Capitulation that specifically forbade any reprisals against surrendered officers and soldiers. The Secretary at War did nothing leaving the matter to Washington and the Congress. Almost as soon as he had given the order to take a hostage, Washington regretted his actions. He realized too late that what he had done was undoubtedly illegal. He sought desperately to find an unconditional prisoner. If such a person had been found, at least he would have cleared the legal hurdles, but he had no luck. He turned to the members of Congress for support, which they gave by a unanimous vote endorsing his actions. Nonetheless, he continued to agonize. I most devoutly wish his life may be saved, but duty calls me to make this decisive determination, he wrote to Brigadier General Elias Dayton. Not everyone on the American side agreed with Washington. Alexander Hamilton who had served closely with the general and knew him well, thought that the whole business of retaliation was repugnant, wanton, and unnecessary. Hamilton knew that Washington's pride made it difficult for him to back away. He urged Henry Knox, Washington's closest confidant, to help him find an honorable exit. Might Knox, he wrote, engage some obscure agents to settle the crisis? It is said the commander-in-chief has pledged himself for it and cannot recede. Inconsistency in this case would be better than consistency, but pretexts may be found and will be readily admitted in favor of humanity. Knox, too, was troubled, but he made no reply to Hamilton. Second-guessing the commander-in-chief was dangerous business. For once, General Clinton fell into some luck. Two days after Lippincott's court-martial convened, Sir Guy Carleton arrived. Clinton was relieved of duty. 
The matter rested with Sir Guy and the American Congress. End quote. Carleton is not on a mission of war. While there are many in the British military leadership who still want to take one more shot at the Americans, Guy Carleton is under orders to quell tensions in the 13 colonies. The war is heating up in the West Indies, and the last thing the British Empire needs is another flare-up of violence in North America. Carleton is particularly contemptuous of Franklin, Lippincott, and other loyalist leaders who he views as subverting British policy by trying to stoke conflict. So against Franklin's wishes, Carleton moves forward with a speedy court-martial of Lippincott, which he hopes will defuse the situation and convince Washington to release Askill. But when he's on trial, Lippincott says that he was just following orders when he hanged Captain Huddy and that as far as he knew, the American had been lawfully condemned. The court-martial returns a verdict of not guilty, which only further angers George Washington, who demands to see the minutes of the trial. Carleton delays for several weeks, during which time Washington's temper seems to cool. Not only does he regret condemning an innocent man to death, but he recognizes that what began as a military affair has now become much bigger. If he moves ahead with the execution, he risks exacerbating a series of retaliations that could result in many needless deaths. Recognizing that this is now a political decision, not a military one, Washington puts Askill's execution on hold and sends the minutes of Lippincott's court-martial to Congress along with a letter updating them on the situation and putting Captain Asgill's fate in their hands. Returning to William M. Fowler's account, quote, Washington's letter, along with the packet from Carleton, arrived in Philadelphia on August 25th and was designated to a committee of five, and there it sat in silence. Others, however, were not silent particularly Captain Askill's mother, Lady Teresa. With the young captain's father, Sir Charles Askill, sidelined by an apoplectic fit, Lady Askill took up her son's cause. She left no stone unturned, and with her family connections, she waged a vigorous letter-writing campaign, including correspondence with the French foreign minister, the Comte de Vergen. My son an only son, and dear as he is brave, amiable as deserving to be so, only nineteen, a prisoner under articles of capitulation of Yorktown, is now confined in America, an object of retaliation. She pleaded with Virgin to intercede. I will pray that heaven may grant you may never want the comfort it is in your power to bestow on my son. She also played her own English connections and wrote to Lord Cornwallis, asking that he intercede. Lady Askill's aristocrat-to-aristocrat line of communication worked. Vergen shared her plea with the king and queen, and then wrote to Washington, not as a minister of the king, but as a tender father, urging clemency. Passing the buck again, Washington forwarded the two letters, Lady Asgill to Vergen and Vergen's to him, to Congress without any observation. Not everyone in Congress was inclined to clemency, but the letters did have an impact. They were, in the wards of Elias Bodineau, enough to move the heart of a savage. By a unanimous vote, Congress freed Captain Charles Asgill as a compliment to the King of France. Washington conveyed the news to Asgill while doing what he could to preserve his own honor in the sad business. He assured Asgill, In whatever light my agency in this unpleasing affair may be viewed, I was never influenced through the whole of it by sanguinary motives, but by what I conceived a sense of my duty which loudly called upon me to take measures, however disagreeable, 
to prevent a repetition of those enormities which have been the subject of discussion, and that this important end is likely to be answered without the effusion of the blood of an innocent person is not a greater relief to you than it is to me. End quote. While I have no doubt that Washington is glad not to have Asgill executed, I doubt that anyone is more relieved than the young man himself. What's not doubtful is that this solution has left Guy Carleton out of the loop. Instead of acting as peacemaker between the British and the Americans, he now has the French foreign minister to thank for sparing Asgill's life. Due in large part to the Asgill affair, Carleton's relationship with George Washington, which had gotten off to a rocky start, will never recover and will only get worse through the end of the war. The last days of the American War for Independence also see a lot of low-level violence along the western frontier. There are too many small incidents to talk about all of them, so instead I want to touch on a few. When I did my initial outline for all this back in December, I wrote down all of these four incidents as bullet points, which would normally be expanded into their own sections in the script. But now that we're here, the nitty-gritty of the war in the West just isn't as impactful as some of the big-picture stuff I still want to get to. So instead, I will try to be brief, and these four Western incidents will just be expanded bullet points, and will Take them in chronological order. In the Ohio country, the war is continuing as it has been for the past few years, with very small numbers of British troops and American militia, and usually larger numbers of Native American allies. This low-level warfare might not involve a ton of men, but it's some of the bloodiest fighting in the entire war. It hasn't always been this way. It has slowly escalated throughout the war, and some of the worst violence happens to people who aren't even involved. Peaceful Native Americans just trying to live their lives in a wilderness that has turned into a war zone. Some of these Native Americans are the Christian Muncie. These are a loose group of Indians, mostly from the Lenape and Mohican tribes, who have converted to Moravian Christianity. And it just so happens that the particular brand of Moravian Christianity they've adopted is entirely pacifist, so they have refused to fight with either the British or the Americans on religious grounds. Unfortunately, uh, rather than being left alone, this has led to both sides becoming suspicious of them. The British have even engaged in forced relocations along the frontier, moving the Christian Muncie deeper into British-held territory where they can be closely monitored. In early 1782... Around a hundred of these people return from deep in British territory to their hometown of Gnadenhutten along the frontier and are trying to rebuild their farms in preparation for the spring. They basically have been allowed to go out and get as many supplies as they can and uh, thus feed their people who are still being forced to live further back in British territory. And at this time, many Lenape tribes are actively at war with the Americans, and a lot of the American militiamen have lost family members in raids, and many have stopped distinguishing between hostile and friendly Native Americans. Now, throw in the fact that these Moravian Christian Native Americans are neutral and the risk of violence increases. On March 6, 1782, 
A party of between 100 and 200 Pennsylvania militia under the command of Lieutenant Colonel David Williamson approached the town of Gnadenhuten. They tell the Christian Muncie that they're in danger and that the militia has come to escort them east to the safety of Fort Pitt. The Christian Muncie feed the militiamen and recognize this as a polite way of telling them that there's about to be another forced relocation similar to the one the British subjected them to last year. Being pacifists, they agree to go along rather than resist, and they even hand over their hunting rifles for the duration of the journey. At the same time, some of the militiamen go to the nearby Native American village of Salem and tell the people there something similar, and those people are escorted back to Nottenhuten on March 7th, again ostensibly to be taken to Fort Pitt. Once all of the Christian Muncie are gathered together, the militia rush them, tie them up, and accuse them of being British spies, which they deny. The militia then holds a kangaroo court and votes to condemn all the Christian Muncie to death. The Native Americans are allowed to take the night to prepare themselves while the militiamen get drunk. The next day, the female Indians are systematically raped on the village green before 96 of the local Christian Muncie are murdered by being struck on the head with a hammer and then scalped. There are only two survivors. Small boys who are rescued in the confusion by some dissenting militiamen. There are 18 of these dissenters in all, militiamen who refuse to go along with the massacre, and while as far as I can tell, Lieutenant Colonel Williamson and the perpetrators remain silent about the event, these 18 men and two boys tell anyone who will listen. The story of the massacre is spread far and wide by Moravian Christian missionaries, and other Christian Muncie in the area are able to flee to the relative safety of British-held land before the Pennsylvania militia can get their hands on them. Today, the 96 murdered Lenape are considered martyrs by the Moravian Church, slaughtered because they tried to live in peace as their faith commanded them. Reprisals are swift and brutal. Upon hearing of the massacre, British allied Lenape tribes throughout the West execute their American captives. Several tribes that had been neutral began leaning towards the British. Some that had leaned towards the Americans begin to take a more neutral approach. George Washington is appalled by the massacre and chooses not to escalate. Instead, simply ordering Continental Army officers to steer clear of Lenape territory to avoid any provocation. After the war in 1785, Congress will officially return Gnadenhuten and the surrounding area to the Christian Muncie, but there will be few takers. By that point, most of the survivors have already settled north or west, and in 1823, Congress buys back the land. Lieutenant Colonel Williamson is never punished. Instead, he goes on to become the second-in-command during the Crawford Expedition, in which 500 Pennsylvania militia end up surrounded and nearly wiped out by a combined British and Lenape force. In a cruel twist of fate, that expedition's commander, Colonel William Crawford, is captured and tortured to death in reprisal for the Gnadenhuten Massacre, while Lieutenant Colonel Williamson manages to escape and ends up living another 31 years, never being held responsible for his acts. In August of 1782, a Patriot force of around 200 men is defeated by a much larger joint British-Native American force in modern-day Kentucky. This battle... The Battle of Blue Licks 
threatens to give the British an opening into the colonies from the West, should the war continue and should Parliament decide to once again go on the offensive. To keep the British from getting too comfortable, George Rogers Clark will launch a series of retaliatory raids throughout November. September of 1782 will see the last real battle of the war in North America, the Siege of Fort Henry. Fort Henry is an American-held fort deep in the Ohio Territory. Defended by only 40 Patriot militia, it comes under attack by more than 300 Loyalist militia. This battle is mostly famous for the actions of Betty Zane, a young woman who's under siege with the Patriots. She lives in a cabin around 60 yards from the fort, and when the defenders start to run low on gunpowder, she volunteers to get some from the cabin, where her brother had hidden a large stash under the floorboards. When she leaves the fort, defended only by the fact that she's a woman and therefore at least theoretically a non-combatant, the British and Native Americans hold their fire as she walks calmly to the cabin and goes inside. It's only when Betty Zane emerges from the cabin a few minutes later and starts carrying a large package back to the fort under one arm that the attackers realize what's going on and begin firing at her. She runs through the gunfire like an 18th century action hero, somehow doesn't get shot, and delivers the gunpowder. Thanks to her actions, the defenders are able to hold out and force a British withdrawal. And that brings us to the end of the war in North America. There will continue to be clashes between Loyalist and Patriot militias in New Jersey, but these clashes are not sanctioned by either side, and in many cases they look more like gang fights than actual warfare. The Americans aren't the only ones battling Native Americans during the American War for Independence. The Spanish have to deal with several Native American rebellions, many funded by the British. In his book, Spain and the Independence of the United States, an Intrinsic Gift, American historian Thomas E. Chavez writes, quote, The most spectacular of these rebellions was led by the mestizo leader Tupac Amaro, who was involved in fighting that stood in stark contrast to the almost civilized warfare with the British. In the north-central part of South America, jungle and mountain warfare of the worst kind raged. Fighting extended into the Andes and to elevations of 18,000 feet. It is not surprising that a document from the area, giving an account of the capture of Tupac Amaro, is included among the records of the Caribbean conflict, for both theaters were related. Tupac Amaru had been leading a successful and terrifying rebellion. After a pitched battle in knee-deep snow involving 9,000 Spanish soldiers and a rebel army of 10 to 12,000 men and nine cannons, Tupac Amaru and his family were captured. He had become the focus of Spanish officials, and news of his capture and execution virtually ended native resistance during the period. Nevertheless, the influence of that resistance on Spain's wartime effectiveness in late 1781 cannot be stressed enough. End quote. Following the British defeat at Yorktown in October of 1781, the French and Spanish prepare for another offensive in 1782, this time aimed at Jamaica, the heart of British power in the Caribbean and the empire's most prosperous colony outside of India. Thanks to its sugar plantations, Jamaica is worth more in taxes than the entire 13 colonies combined. Defending the island is a fleet of 36 ships of the line and several smaller ships, commanded by Admirals George Rodney and Samuel Hood. The Spanish have assembled their own fleet of 12 ships of the line at Hispaniola, which are waiting to rendezvous with a French fleet of 30 ships of the line sailing from Europe. These ships, 
along with many transports and over 15,000 troops, are supposed to attack and invade Jamaica. To prevent that, Rodney and Hood decide to intercept the incoming French fleet before it can combine with the Spanish fleet and gain a significant numerical advantage over the British. During the battle, the wind turns against the French, allowing British warships to sail up the middle of their line of battle, breaking it in two and capturing the French flagship along with the French Admiral de Grasse, who had so recently defeated the British fleet in Chesapeake Bay in the battle that made Yorktown possible. This battle in the Caribbean, combined with recent British victories in India and the battle at Gibraltar we talked about in episode 54, this serves to stabilize the situation on the geostrategic level, which means that any decisive war would need to be incredibly long and bloody. So both sides decide to make peace, although the negotiations will drag on well into 1783. In August of that year, with negotiations still ongoing, Guy Carleton receives official orders to evacuate his troops from New York City. Much like the evacuation of Charleston in 1782, this is no easy task. By this point, the writing has been on the wall for nearly two years, and New York's homes and boarding houses are packed with Loyalist citizens trying to flee the United States before the official surrender. In all, Carleton is responsible for nearly 30,000 of these people who were evacuating to locations throughout the British Empire, although mostly to Canada. There are an additional 3,000 or so freedmen, right? These former slaves that the British have liberated. While the official terms of the yet-to-be-signed treaty demand the return of these slaves, Carleton refuses to return a single freedman to slavery, instead using his broad authority as commander-in-chief to purchase his, their freedom using the army's funds. Despite their strained relationship, Carleton and Washington are able to work together to ensure that the evacuation is as safe as possible. In the end, every last British soldier, loyalist citizen, and freed slave is evacuated. On November 25th, Guy Carleton leaves Manhattan on the last ship and sails across New York Harbor to Staten Island, where the last of the evacuation is completed a few days later. The same day, November 25th, George Washington marches into Manhattan from the north. Alongside New York Governor George Clinton, he leads a column of Continental Army troops past Fort Washington, and all the way to the battery at the southern tip of the island. Along the way, the army is joined by a growing crowd, and the city spends all night celebrating. There is much uncertainty ahead for the new American nation, but this night is time for celebration. A revolution isn't just a military event. More importantly, it's a political one, and the American Revolution doesn't come to fruition until several years after the last shots are fired. I want to talk a little bit about the early Republic, but first I want to talk about the rest of the world because the peace treaty that ends the American War for Independence isn't a single treaty, it's four. One between Britain and the United States, another between Britain and France, a third between Britain and Spain, and a fourth between Britain and the Netherlands. And while the treaty with the United States is one of many treaties known as the Treaty of Paris, the collective peace agreement is known as the Peace of Paris. Representatives from Britain, France, Spain, and the United States signed their respective treaties on September 3, 1783, and while the 
Dutch and British will sign their own preliminary agreement on September 2nd. They won't finalize the peace until May of the following year. The territorial changes are significant. Not only does the British Empire recognize the independence of the 13 colonies, but the Crown agrees to hand over all British land south of Canada and east of the Mississippi to the United States, opening huge swaths of territory for settlement and expansion. It's worth noting that the Native Americans who live in this area are not consulted, and both Britain and Spain will bankroll Native American resistance movements for several years in a bid to weaken the young United States and keep it occupied. This does not go well for the Native Americans, and it further exacerbates existing bad blood between many tribes and the American settlers, which is a rivalry that will ultimately nearly wipe out many Native American cultures. For the French, getting involved in the American Revolution is a disaster. France manages to take a few shots at the British Empire, but has only gained the Caribbean island of Tobago. In exchange, France has taken on enough war loans to almost double its national debt. This puts the kingdom on an unsustainable financial course that will lead directly to emergency tax increases, the calling of a national assembly, and ultimately the French Revolution. It's worth pointing out that this wasn't what Louis XVI had in mind. He'd imagined much larger territorial gains for France and a weaker United States at odds with Great Britain and in need of a strong, established trading partner. Instead, when French negotiators propose a trade agreement with the United States as a junior partner, American negotiators refuse to sign. Giving the U.S. access to the vast territory between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi River is a brilliant piece of geopolitical jujitsu on the British part. See, the U.S. now has enough resources to be a regional power almost from the beginning and doesn't have to sign unfavorable treaties. Instead, political personal and cultural bonds will ultimately lead the U.S. to signing a trade agreement, the Jay Treaty, with Great Britain in 1794. This won't solve all points of friction between the two countries, and the U.S. and Great Britain will even go to war again briefly in 1812. But for the most part, relations remain friendly and stable, foiling France's plans to prop up another anti-British power, and laying the foundations for today's enduring special relationship between the United States and Great Britain. This leads us to the outcome of the war for the British, which isn't all that bad. The British Empire loses some land, including the 13 colonies, but it also gets rid of a lot of expenses. Remember when we talked about the finances of the 13 colonies and how the British Empire was barely breaking even by holding on to them? Well, now Britain can continue to benefit from American trade without spending a single pound sterling on American military defense. It's a good deal, and it's emblematic of how pragmatic the British Empire is during this time period. This little venture in the 13 colonies isn't going so well. Well, we are the British Empire Incorporated. We'll just spin off America Incorporated and we'll trade with them and we'll do it that way. Kind of effective. Other than the United States, Spain is probably the biggest winner of the American Revolution. In the Peace of Paris... Spain gains the Mediterranean island of Menorca, as well as regaining East and West Florida from the British. At the end of 1783, the Spanish Empire in the Americas reaches its zenith. On paper, it extends from modern-day Minnesota in the north 
to Tierra del Fuego in the south, including all of North America south of Georgia and all of South America outside of Brazil. It's interesting to imagine what they might have done with that had the Spanish Empire been better administered. The Netherlands loses all trading posts on the Indian mainland, but maintains its control on the island of Ceylon, which is modern-day Sri Lanka. However, the Dutch are forced to allow free trading rights for British ships in the Dutch East Indies, as well as to set up more British trading ports further to the east in places like Singapore, expanding British trade and disrupting the Dutch monopoly in that area. This is yet another win for Great Britain. So much for how the war's participating nations have fared. But what about the individual people? We'll talk about George Washington shortly because he's hugely consequential, but our story has involved a lot of characters, both major and minor, and I'd like to touch on some of them and finish up their parts of the tale. First up are the Howe brothers, William and Richard, who had commanded the British land and sea forces respectively in 1777. At the time, some in Parliament are calling for an official inquiry into their management of the war. Both brothers demand a full parliamentary investigation, which finds that while the war did not go well for the British in 1777, there was no mismanagement or malfeasance on the part of either Howe brother. Vindicated, the elder brother Admiral Richard Howe would refuse to take another command, having lost all trust in Lord North's administration. Instead, he would join Parliament in 1779 as a member of the opposition and would be a harsh critic of British naval policy for the next three years. Following the fall of Lord North's government in 1782, Richard Howe would once again accept a naval command, this time as commander of the Channel Fleet. That's Britain's main fleet that protects the home islands in their vicinity. It's Admiral Howe who commands the relief of Gibraltar, crushing Spanish hopes of retaking the territory and helping to bring the war to a close. Following this impressive performance, he would be promoted to First Lord of the Admiralty, the head of the Royal Navy, which is a post he would hold for the next five years. Richard Howe would again command the Channel Fleet in the early days of the French Revolution, and would win his most famous victory in 1794 at the Fourth Battle of Ushant, better known to history as the Glorious First of June. He retires shortly thereafter, and spends his remaining years as a respected elder statesman until his death in 1799. The younger brother, General William Howe, spends the rest of the war on inactive duty, although he does serve for a time on King George's Privy Council. In the 1790s, he serves in a couple of senior leadership positions on the British Isles, commanding both the northern and eastern military districts. These sound like fancy titles, but basically he's responsible for recruiting as many men as possible to fight in the French Revolution should that become necessary. While he lives until 1814, he's not in good health, and he's forced to retire in 1803. Moving on, we come to General Henry Clinton, who served as British Commander-in-Chief from General Howe's resignation until his own replacement by Guy Carleton in 1782. In 1783, Clinton would publish a booklet blaming Lord Cornwallis for the British failures in the 1782 campaign. Cornwallis responds in kind, which doesn't look good for either of them. Clinton also serves in Parliament until 1784 before retiring, then coming out of retirement in 1790. In 1794, he's appointed as governor of Gibraltar, a prestigious post, but he dies unexpectedly before he's able to take command. Meanwhile, Clinton's would-be rival, Lord Cornwallis, is appointed governor-general and commander-in-chief of India in 1786, 
where he expands British rule and lays the foundation for an Indian civil administration that would remain mostly in place until Indian independence. After returning to Europe in 1794, Cornwallis puts down a rebellion in Ireland and is instrumental in passing the Act of Union that creates the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. He would then help to negotiate one of several peace treaties the British would sign with Napoleonic France before being appointed as governor of India again. Shortly after arriving there in summer of 1805, he catches a tropical fever, dies, and is buried in a tomb overlooking the Ganges, a tomb that remains a public monument in India to this day. Guy Carleton, who oversaw the evacuation of New York, is rewarded with the governorship of Canada. In 1791, Canada is split into Upper and Lower Canada, providing separate administrations for the British and French-speaking parts of the territory. Each of these administrations now has its own governor, which leaves Carleton out of a job. Thankfully, he's been made a baron in the meantime, which means he's a member of the House of Lords and has loads of money. He returns to England and leads a quiet, uneventful life until his death in 1808. Moving from the British to the American side of our drama, we come to Samuel Adams, the Boston activist and political firebrand who helped foment the Boston Tea Party and light the spark for the American Revolution. Adams is a politician, not a fighter, and he serves in the Continental Congress and is the Massachusetts delegate on the committee that writes the Articles of Confederation. He retires from Congress in 1781, but remains active in Massachusetts politics for some time. Adams remains a controversial figure to this day. On the one hand, he strongly supports state sovereignty and will initially oppose the creation of the U.S. Constitution and a strong federal government, although he will change his mind when the Bill of Rights is created, ensuring that certain freedoms are enshrined in law. Adams is also instrumental in the establishment of Boston's free public school system, which provides education to girls as well as boys, a progressive stance in this era. On the other hand, Adams also takes a strong stand in favor of wealthy merchants and against poor farmers during the Shays' Rebellion. In the wake of the American War for Independence, the continental dollar is barely worth the paper it's printed on and foreign merchants will only accept trade in exchange for hard currency, meaning gold or silver. Big Massachusetts traders, in turn, make the switch to gold and silver money, and local merchants follow suit because they need hard currency to pay their suppliers. At the end of this chain are the local farmers who have no way to obtain hard currency and quickly fall into both personal debt and tax debt. John Hancock, the state's populist governor, refuses to prosecute tax debtors or allow the creation of debtors' courts to prosecute private debts. But Hancock is forced to retire in 1785 due to poor health, and the new governor, James Baldwin, quickly moves to prosecute both tax and private debts. Unable to pay, many farmers soon have their lands and homes seized by the courts. A Revolutionary War veteran named Daniel Shays begins to lead protests against the courts, but in August of 1786, the Massachusetts Assembly adjourns without responding to the protesters. Shays and others then arm themselves and begin to forcibly shut down local courthouses. When Congress refuses to intervene... Governor Baldwin raises the Massachusetts militia in January of 1787, and the militia puts down the rebellion, which comes to be known as Shays' Rebellion. All the while, Samuel Adams is cheerleading for the state government and the tax collectors, and he even publishes a pamphlet calling for the rebel leaders to be hanged. When called out for this apparent hypocrisy, after all, the Boston Tea Party was a tax protest, Adams points out that 
he had been protesting against taxes from an unrepresentative government, while Shays and his supporters are protesting against taxes from a Republican government. Left unsaid is the fact that Adams is a career politician who relies on the support of wealthy Boston merchants to pay his bills. Ironically, Shays' rebellion will be one of the main events that leads to the creation of the U.S. federal government, which Adams is initially so opposed to. The argument being that individual state militias shouldn't shoulder the burden of putting down armed rebellions. There should be a federal government to handle that job. Anyway, Samuel Adams will go on to serve four one-year terms as governor of Massachusetts before retiring for good in 1797. He dies in 1803 and remains one of the most iconic figures of the American Revolution. Even people who know nothing about history can recognize his image on Samuel Adams' beer. The Marquis de Lafayette is only 26 years old at the end of the American War for Independence. He has a long and distinguished career ahead of him, and is a major player in the early days of the French Revolution. Since we'll be discussing that revolution in the next set of episodes, I won't go into it here. Suffice it to say that Lafayette is eventually known as the Hero of Two Worlds, and in 1824, at the age of 67, he returns to the United States to visit a few dignitaries and celebrate the country's upcoming 50th anniversary. When he arrives in New York, he intends to make a quick trip to Boston, and then go home, but in each small town he comes to, the roads are lined with people eager to see one of the last living legends of the American Revolution, and Lafayette stays in each town as long as he can. This turns into a national tour where Lafayette visits every U.S. state, including new states that hadn't even existed in the time of the Revolution. He tours Louisiana, Mississippi, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and Missouri. In Virginia, he visits George Washington's grave at Mount Vernon before stopping to have dinner with America's third president, Thomas Jefferson. In Boston, he dines with John Adams, the second president. He almost drowns when his riverboat sinks on the Ohio River, and he takes the newly completed Erie Canal from Niagara Falls to Albany. He even gets to visit the new city of Fayetteville, North Carolina, one of many American locations named in his honor. Everywhere he goes, Lafayette is cheered by crowds, and every local elected official is lining up so they can be seen shaking his hand. When he returns to France, he takes with him a jar of soil from Bunker Hill, so when he dies, it can be sprinkled on his grave, and he can be buried beneath both French and American soil. Baron von Steuben, the father of the American army, would be granted U.S. citizenship almost immediately upon the conclusion of the war. This is a guy who will never again have to pay for his own meals or open a door for himself, for that matter. He settles in New York with a young man named William North, who is most likely his lover. I say most likely because while there's no doubt that von Steuben is gay, he and North leave us with no conclusive proof of their romantic relationship. All I'll say is that in these times, gay men have to remain in the closet if they want to continue to move about in high society, so any steamy love letters would have been burnt after reading. Von Steuben ultimately settles near the modern-day city of Rome in upstate New York. He receives a government pension for his military service and enjoys a comfortable retirement until his death in 1794. Horatio Gates, George Washington's main rival amongst the other American generals, is reasonably successful in his own right. Although he sadly loses his wife in 1783, he remarries in 1786, this time to a wealthy English immigrant. In 1790, he sells his Virginia plantation 
and the bill of sale comes with the stipulation that the slaves must be freed, some after five years, some when they reach their 28th birthday. Now, this might not seem like much in the way of emancipation, but keep in mind that other figures of this time who give up their slaves give them up in their wills, right, after their death. Right? Gates liberates his slaves during his lifetime. Otherwise, he keeps a fairly low profile, although he does run for a seat in the New York State Legislature in the year 1800. That same year, he breaks with his longtime friend and the current president, John Adams, and endorses Thomas Jefferson's bid for the presidency. Both Jefferson and Gates win their elections, although Gates only serves a single term before his death in 1806. Nathaniel Green's post-war story is a sad one. Ever a reliable supporter of the Patriot cause, Green had personally guaranteed some military loans to keep his men clothed and fed during the Yorktown campaign. Well, now the bills are due, and his estate in Newport, Rhode Island, can't even begin to cover the cost. I can't believe I'd never mentioned this, but... Old reliable Nathaniel Green is a Quaker, and that's a bit unusual for an army officer because Quakers aren't supposed to engage in violence. It's against their religion. Green has violated his religion for the cause of American freedom, which he sees as a higher value. Well, now he's going to have to violate another one of his religion's tenets, the one against holding slaves. As a reward for his service in the Southern Campaign, Green has been granted a plantation outside Savannah, Georgia, and he reluctantly accepts it in order to pay off his debts. He dies there a few years later in 1786. From sunstroke, he suffers in the Southern heat. Last but not least, I want to touch on Benedict Arnold one more time, because to me, he's a tragic figure. He's a man who should have been a hero. He's a man who was a hero on more than one occasion. But like any tragic figure, he has a tragic flaw, and that's his ego. He can't stand being overlooked again and again in favor of politically connected officers who aren't half the man he is. So rather than stay the course, he finally changes sides betrays his cause, and becomes a traitor. Following the war, he finds it hard to obtain employment. He's turned down for several army positions, as well as a position with the East India Company. Put simply, his reputation as a traitor precedes him, and few reputable people will do business with him. Benedict and Peggy Arnold eventually settle in the Canadian city of St. John, New Brunswick, where he runs a series of businesses into the ground. He eventually finds success as a merchant sailor and later becomes a privateer during the French Revolution, until he's captured by the French on the Caribbean island of Guadeloupe and almost hanged. He narrowly escapes, but when he returns to St. John, He's no longer in good enough physical condition to sail. His bad leg, wounded at Saratoga, has always bothered him, and now he's got gout in his other leg. It's all swollen. His foot and ankle are so enormous and so crippled with pain that he can barely move, and he soon dies in 1801 at the age of 60. As I said, the American Revolution isn't just a war. In that respect, it's not all that different from many other 18th century wars. What makes the Revolution special is the political and social change it creates, both in the Americas and in Europe. In 1783, the war is over, but the hard work still remains creating a stable social and political order. This is a long and involved story, 
and I realize I may have written myself into a corner trying to tie up everything in one episode. Instead, I want to take more of a top-down view of the nation-building process. Let's see how this goes. In March of 1781, Maryland becomes the final state to sign the Articles of Confederation, an early constitution that is in many ways similar to today's constitution. And I don't want to get too far into the weeds, uh, mostly because we've, we've already discussed this in an earlier episode, but there are two main differences. Uh, to begin with, Congress's powers are not as clearly spelled out under the Articles of Confederation as they are under the U.S. Constitution. For example, there is a full faith and credit clause that we quoted in episode 53. And the original reads, quote, Full faith and credit shall be given in each of these states to the records, acts, and judicial proceedings of the courts and magistrates of every other state, end quote. Today's clause reads, quote, Full faith and credit shall be given in each state to the public acts, records, and judicial proceedings of every other state. And the Congress may by general laws prescribe the manner in which such acts, records, and proceedings shall be proved and the effect thereof, end quote. Minus some trivial changes, the main difference is the second part, so let me repeat it. The Congress may by general laws prescribe the manner in which such acts, records, and proceedings shall be proved and the effect thereof. The Articles of Confederation don't have that clause. And without that clause, individual states are able to argue that their own state courts get to interpret the full faith and credit clause as they see fit. The Articles don't explicitly state that Congress gets to play referee, so they have to sit on the sidelines. And under the Articles of Confederation, the only federal courts are piracy courts, so you have 13 state court systems, each of which says that its own interpretation of this clause of the Articles of Confederation is the correct interpretation. This starts to cause trouble almost immediately. In May of 1782, just 14 months after the Articles of Confederation are ratified, a guy named Allen, I couldn't find his first name, is arrested in New Jersey because he owes a lot of money. Debtors' prisons are a thing back then in the United States, and he spends the next six months in prison before being released on bail. He then goes to Pennsylvania, where he's arrested in April of 1783 for the same debt. He posts bail in Pennsylvania and returns to New Jersey, where in October of 1783 his debts are written off by a state court because, let's face it, the guy is clearly insolvent. Unfortunately for Allen, he makes the mistake of going back to Pennsylvania, where he has the misfortune of once again being arrested for the debts that got written off in New Jersey. The case is eventually decided in the Court of Common Pleas in Philadelphia in the 1786 case, James v. Allen. In its judgment, the court rules against Allen, stating, quote, The Articles of Confederation, which direct that full faith and credit shall be given in one state to the records, acts, and judicial proceedings of the others, will not admit of the construction contended for. Otherwise, executions might issue in one state upon the judgments given in another, but seem chiefly intended to oblige each state to receive the records of another as full evidence of such acts and judicial proceedings. End quote. This is a huge problem. In plain English, it means that contracts and court judgments executed in one state aren't necessarily valid in other states, which flies in the face of the full faith and credit clause. Full faith and credit means full faith and credit, not we'll take it into consideration. 
And this is an issue with many aspects of the Articles of Confederation. Uh, Congress is basically relegated to the role of an advisory body for most purposes, and the individual state courts and state legislatures kind of go their own way. And this isn't just a matter of one clause of the Articles of Confederation, it's a problem for all of the clauses. This leads us to the second main difference between the Articles of Confederation and today's U.S. Constitution, and that's the fact that the Articles of Confederation don't give the federal government any tax authority whatsoever. In theory, it's supposed to be funded by voluntary contributions from the state governments, which means that in practice, the United States is constantly broke. So even when Congress does have the authority to act, they aren't able to. Shays' Rebellion breaks out in 1786 in Massachusetts, and Congress can't send in the army. Why? Because the army consists of one regiment on the western frontier and a few dozen guys at West Point guarding the nation's artillery. Why? Because Congress has no money. Also because many people in the early United States view the idea of a standing army as totalitarian and inimical to free Republican government, but largely because there's no money. And this isn't just about funding the army or any other service. Congress borrowed a lot of money to pay for the War of Independence, and they need to find a way to repay that national debt. The government does establish a national bank at the urging of Alexander Hamilton, and that bank does turn a profit. But its aggressive debt collection methods cause so much backlash that Pennsylvania soon revokes its charter and the bank goes private not long after that. <laughs> this is the United States under the Articles of Confederation. The individual states can just cancel the national bank. <laughs> uh, and this is pretty much par for the course for the first American government. And it illustrates why Connecticut Representative Samuel Huntington, the first president of the Congress of the Confederation, gets no credit for kind of sort of being the first president of the United States. Other presidents of the Congress of the Confederation include Thomas Mifflin, Richard Henry Lee, Cyrus Griffin, and John Hancock, among others. And nobody gives them any credit either. Aside from providing an impotent government, the Articles of Confederation also do nothing to prevent trade barriers from arising between the states. And most states begin charging taxes on imports from other states. And you've got to imagine the trouble this causes when you're talking about trade not just from one state to another, but... Maybe you want to send goods through several states, and now you've got to pay an import tax every time you cross a border? Anyone who's familiar with the concept of exponential growth knows that doesn't work. And to most people, both inside and outside the United States, it's obvious from the get-go that this is not an effective system. And reforms begin in March of 1785, just two years after the official end of the American War for Independence. At that time, delegates from Maryland and Virginia meet at George Washington's estate at Mount Vernon, and they hammer out a commerce agreement between the two states. With Washington presiding... The delegates negotiate navigation and fishing rights on the Chesapeake Bay, Potomac River, and other shared waterways between Virginia and Maryland. They also agree to common weights and measures, river tolls, and even debt collection laws. This conference, now known as the Mount Vernon Conference, is so successful that its terms are still in force to this day. As a result, 
The Virginia Assembly calls another convention to be held in Annapolis, Maryland the following year. Delegates from New York, New Jersey, Delaware, and Pennsylvania convene in September of 1786 to bang out a broader agreement between those various states. Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and North Carolina also send delegates to what will be called the Annapolis Convention, but for one reason or another, they don't arrive on time. Georgia, Connecticut, and South Carolina don't send any delegates, and oddly enough, neither does Maryland, despite the fact that the convention is being held in Annapolis, which is Maryland's state capital. Even so, five states are in attendance, and as they try to negotiate trade issues and navigation on American waterways, they keep running into the same problem. There's no enforcement mechanism without some kind of effective federal government. Without that, individual states can and will go back on their agreements. The New Jersey delegates recommend a new convention with broader powers, and all the delegates to the Annapolis Convention decide to send a report to Congress requesting it to call this Convention of the States. Remember, this is at the same time that Shays' Rebellion is happening in Massachusetts, and Congress agrees to the Annapolis Convention's plan, with each state to send a delegation to Philadelphia in May of 1787. This 1787 convention comes to be known as the Constitutional Convention. And I've struggled with how to talk about this because there's just so much going on and you could get into so much granular detail. People have done entire podcasts on the Constitutional Convention. But this isn't a show about American civics. This is part of a broader history with a focus on nationalism. And in that spirit, I want to wrap up this sequence of episodes the way it began. Back in episode 52, we started by going through the American Declaration of Independence and talking about the origins of the Revolution. Well, let's go through the Constitution and see how things turned out. Before we do that, I should mention that the American Constitution is written within the framework of British common law, so they don't take time to define terms like legislature or executive, because those things already have established meanings. I will try to define terms where I think it's necessary, and I'll be skipping big chunks that talk about finer details that aren't important to our discussion. Anyway, let's begin. Quote, We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. End quote. This preamble establishes that the powers granted to the federal government by the Constitution are derived from the people. This is a big deal. There's no monarch who has been appointed by God. There's no landed aristocracy exercising ancient familial privilege. Instead, what the founders are talking about is the idea of popular sovereignty, which is an Enlightenment idea that originated with Thomas Hobbes and was expanded on by writers like Locke and Rousseau. These Enlightenment thinkers argue that all people are born with the same fundamental rights, as well as duties towards their fellow citizens. This isn't a new idea. You can find it in ancient Greece, as well as in many tribal societies and city-states throughout history. But it's the Enlightenment thinkers who make the idea of popular sovereignty explicit, and the United States is the first modern country to be based on it. This begs the question, 
who are we the people, which is at the heart of nationalism. Continuing. Quote, All legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and a House of Representatives. The House of Representatives shall be composed of members chosen every second year by the people of the several states. End quote. Pretty straightforward. The legislature has two chambers, and the first is elected to directly represent the interests of the people. Quote, Representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within this union, according to their respective numbers, which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years, and excluding Indians not taxed, three-fifths of all other persons. End quote. There are two things that are important to point out here. First, uh, representatives are not going to represent uh, Indians not taxed. Native American tribes are recognized as separate nations, and as such, they are neither taxed nor represented in Congress. In practice, this works out poorly for the Native Americans, who are relocated by the government again and again as the American nation expands westward, sometimes dying by the thousands in these forced migrations. But at least on paper, this initially looks consistent with the idea of popular sovereignty, and indeed it is somewhat upheld today with the existence of Indian reservations. The second thing you'll notice is the phrase, three-fifths of all other persons. Not to to put too fine a point on it, but this phrase, all other persons, is referring to slaves. And it's one of several compromises arrived upon in the drafting of the Constitution. The southern states, which have large slave populations, want slaves to count for the purposes of representation. The northern states, which have few slaves and where many people like the Pennsylvania Quakers and the New England Congregationalists are actively opposed to slavery, well, these northern states say that if slaves are property and can't vote, then they shouldn't count towards representation either. So the two sides compromise on three-fifths, and they use the phrase all other persons because some delegates refuse to sign a constitution that explicitly endorses slavery. These delegates include Pennsylvania's John Dickinson, who you may remember as the drafter of the original Articles of Confederation. He and others want to make it absolutely clear that slavery is only upheld by state law, not by federal law. So you will notice a handful of fig leaves throughout the Constitution where it talks about slavery without actually talking about slavery. Following the U.S. Civil War, this part of the Constitution will eventually be revised by the 14th Amendment, which reads in part, quote, All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Representatives shall be apportioned among the several states according to their representative numbers, counting the whole number of persons in each state, excluding Indians not taxed, end quote. This extends representation to all people, regardless of race or origin, and at least in theory, it allows all men age 21 or older to vote. If the 14th Amendment isn't clear enough, the 15th Amendment, ratified just two years later, makes this very clear, quote, 
The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude, end quote. The right to vote will eventually be extended to women with the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920, and the voting age will be lowered to 18 with the passage of the 26th Amendment in 1971. Moving on to the next bit of the Constitution, quote, The Senate of the United States shall be composed of two senators from each state, chosen by the legislature thereof for six years, and each senator shall have one vote. And so we have the House of Representatives, the lower chamber of the legislature, which represents the people. Now we have the Senate the upper chamber, which represents the individual states. And this is another compromise, this time not between the North and the South, but between the more populous states and the less populous ones. See, under a system of national popular sovereignty, the more populous states will have all of the influence in the legislature, which essentially means that voters from less populous states don't matter very much. In the Senate, all states have an equal voice regardless of population. It's worth noting that in 1913, the 17th Amendment is passed, stating that senators are to be elected by the people of each state, not by the state legislature. But each state still gets two senators, regardless of the population. This compromise, with a popularly elected lower house and an upper house elected by the states, is designed to win the support of two political factions called the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. These factions are badly named. The Federalists would better be called Nationalists, since they favor a strong national government. The Anti-Federalists aren't necessarily Anti-Federalist at all. They're Pro-Federalist, meaning they favor a weaker national government and a more power given to the states, a federative system. But... As we have it, the nationalists are called federalists, and the people who favor a federative system are called anti-federalists. Anyway, the federalists, led by Alexander Hamilton, would become America's first political party and would dominate the early republic, not just at the Constitutional Convention, uh, but they would also include the second president, John Adams. The Anti-Federalists would rebrand themselves as the Democratic-Republican Party, including the third president, Thomas Jefferson. While the Federalists dominate the Constitutional Convention, they understand that national unity is important, which is a big reason you see so many compromises between these two factions. The next several passages are interesting to constitutional scholars, but not to anybody else. They give the Senate and the House of Representatives the right to set their own procedural rules, establish rules for holding elections, and some other basic stuff around the business of uh, running the government from day to day. Moving on to the more pertinent parts of the Constitution for our purposes, quote, All bills for raising revenue shall originate in the House of Representatives, but the Senate may propose or concur with amendments as on other bills. Every bill which shall have passed the House of Representatives and the Senate shall, before it become a law, be presented to the President of the United States. If he approve, he shall sign it, but if not, he shall return it with his objections to that house in which it shall have originated, who shall enter the objections at large on their journal and proceed to reconsider it. If after such reconsideration two-thirds of that house shall agree to pass that bill, it shall be sent together with the objections to the other house, by which it shall likewise be reconsidered, and if approved by two-thirds of that house, it shall become a law." 
The Constitution hasn't talked about how the president is chosen yet, but it's already talking about what he can or can't do. Here, we see that the president has power to veto laws, but that that power is limited. If Congress has a two-thirds majority, they can override him and pass a law anyway. This makes Congress the supreme lawmaking authority. So what do they have the authority to do? Well, the Constitution says, quote, The Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. But all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States. End quote. So right off the bat, the new government is legally allowed to fund itself rather than relying on voluntary contributions from the individual states. Quote, to borrow money on the credit of the United States, end quote. Say what you want about the national debt, but you can't run a government without using credit at some point, and Congress has the authority to do that. Moving on, quote, to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes, end quote. This phrase is often called the Commerce Clause, and it forms the basis for much of the federal government's power. For example, the federal government is allowed to regulate and ban drugs, even if those drugs are entirely manufactured and used within the borders of a particular state. Why? Because the drug market is both interstate and international. So if you, for example, grow and produce your own coca leaves into some party powder that theoretically actually does affect the price of cocaine being smuggled into the country by the drug cartels, so it impacts the market and therefore Congress can regulate it. So if you're trying to pass a law and you're not sure whether or not Congress has the authority, well, the Commerce Clause can be a very useful way to get yourself there. Continuing, quote, To establish a uniform rule of naturalization and uniform laws on the subject of bankruptcies throughout the United States. End quote. So, Congress gets to regulate immigration and bankruptcy law. How those things end up in the same clause, I have no idea. Quote, To coin money, regulate the value thereof, and of foreign coin, and fix the standard of weights and measures. To provide for the punishment of counterfeiting the securities and current coin of the United States. End quote. So, Congress gets to create money and punish counterfeiters, as well as to establish exchange rates for foreign currencies. Fixing the standard of weights and measures is a big deal, too. At the time, not all states used the same measurements, so a pound of flour in New Jersey might not weigh the same as a pound of flour in North Carolina. By establishing weights and measures, Congress makes it much easier for merchants to trade. Incidentally, the French will soon establish their own system during the French Revolution, and this system, known as the metric system, will eventually become the standard system of weights and measures for most of the globe. Continuing, quote, to establish post offices and post roads, end quote. This is easy to overlook in the 21st century, when the post office is mostly used for junk mail and for last-mile Amazon deliveries, but up until not that long ago, the Postal Service was the vital communications link across the country. Quote, To promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. End quote. They're talking about patent and copyright law here, enshrining the idea of intellectual property in the Constitution itself. Quote, 
to constitute tribunals inferior to the Supreme Court, to define and punish piracies and felonies committed on the high seas and offenses against the law of nations, to declare war, grant letters of mark and reprisal, and make rules concerning captures on land and water, to raise and support armies, but no appropriation of money to that use shall be for a longer term than two years. End quote. This last point has been more or less interpreted into non-existence. Ordinary government appropriations are year-to-year -year anyway, and multi-year defense contracts aren't considered raising or supporting an army because the army is made up of people and equipment is separate from that for legal reasons. The Constitution then goes on to give Congress various other military powers, uh, the power to maintain a navy, as well as the power to regulate state militias and call them up when required, which is the basis for the modern National Guard. Congress also gets virtually unlimited power in federal districts. These are, quote, forts, magazines, arsenals, dockyards, and other needful buildings, end quote as well as the yet-to-be-named or designated District of Columbus, which houses the U.S. Capitol. In order to do all of this, Congress finally has the power to, quote, "...make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers, and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or officer thereof." End quote. Like the Commerce Clause, this clause, called the Necessary and Proper Clause, has been used to justify a wide array of federal powers. Without getting too far into the weeds, if Congress is authorized to do thing A, then they're allowed to do thing B in order to achieve thing A, as long as thing B is otherwise legal. For example... In the 1819 Supreme Court case McCulloch v. Maryland, the court rules in favor of the Second Bank of the United States and against the state of Maryland, which has tried to tax the bank. In its lawsuit, Maryland argues that because the Constitution doesn't explicitly authorize Congress to create a national bank with special privileges— the national bank should not receive any special privileges and should be subject to state taxes. But the court disagrees. In his ruling, Chief Justice John Marshall rules that because the Second Bank of the United States is a revenue-raising government enterprise, it's protected under the Necessary and Proper Clause. Because Congress is explicitly authorized to, quote, pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States, and, quote, it's implicitly authorized to establish a national bank to raise revenue. So, Congress has broad authority to enact laws as long as those laws aren't forbidden to it by the Constitution. And here, the Constitution begins to lay out some things Congress can't do. It kicks off with, quote, the migration or importation of such persons as any of the states now existing shall think proper to admit shall not be prohibited by the Congress prior to the year 1808, but a tax or duty may be imposed on such importation, not exceeding $10 for each person, end quote. Once again, the founders are referring to slavery without actually using the word slavery. And they're talking about the slave trade here. Remember, slavery is a powerful issue in the South, where the politically dominant upper classes rely on slaves for their fortunes. But for economic reasons that are outside the scope of this episode, both the abolitionists and the slavers are of the belief that slavery is soon going to become economically unviable. In other words, they think it's going to die out on its own in a generation or so. So, they kick the can down the road and continue to allow the importation of new slaves until 1808. Little do they know that 
By that point, the cotton gin will have been invented, and this is a machine that simplifies the most labor-intensive part of the cotton harvesting process, and in the process, it makes slavery not just profitable, but insanely profitable. And this leads the plantation owners to cling to their slaves and refuse to give them up, and eventually... It leads us to the Civil War. Anyway, moving on, quote, The privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless when in cases of rebellion or invasion the public safety may require it. End quote. So the government can't arrest and detain you unless you've been charged with a crime. Quote, no bill of attainder or ex post facto law shall be passed. End quote. A bill of attainder is a bill declaring that a person or group of people is guilty of a crime without the benefit of a trial. An ex post facto law is a law that retroactively makes something illegal. Both of these things are tools that Congress might potentially use to bully individual people or exact political revenge. Uh, for example, a future Congress might pass a law that retroactively makes it a felony to eat an ice cream cone while riding the Marine One helicopter and have Joe Biden arrested. Well, the Constitution says you can't do that. You can only outlaw future conduct. Moving on, quote, No capitation or other direct tax shall be laid unless in proportion to the census or enumeration herein before directed to be taken, end quote. This clause outlaws taxing individual people directly. Instead, taxes are to be imposed on the states, which will collect those taxes as they see fit. In 1913, the 16th Amendment will be ratified, which gives Congress the authority to impose an income tax directly on the people. Moving on, quote, No tax or duty shall be laid on articles exported from any state. No preference shall be given by any regulation of commerce or revenue to the ports of one state over those of another nor shall vessels bound to or from one state be obliged to enter, clear, or pay duties in another. End quote. So the United States is a free trade zone, internally at least. Again, this is to address one of the weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation, which allowed states to charge taxes on goods from other states, which was just bad for everybody. Quote, no money shall be drawn from the treasury, but in consequence of appropriations made by law, and a regular statement and account of the receipts and expenditures of all public money shall be published from time to time, end quote. So the national budget is public information, not secret. Continuing, quote, No title of nobility shall be granted by the United States, and no person holding any office of profit or trust under them shall, without the consent of Congress, accept of any present emolument, office, or title of any kind whatever from any king, prince, or foreign state, end quote. On one level, this is a straightforward break with the old European political systems. The United States is not a monarchy or an aristocracy, and so there is to be no nobility, hereditary or otherwise. But members of Congress, as well as other officeholders, are also forbidden from accepting foreign titles or salaries. This is designed to prevent conflicts of interest. The next few paragraphs of the Constitution impose limits on state power, and they correspond to the powers given to the federal government. So, states are forbidden from entering into foreign treaties, creating their own money, raising their own navies, or otherwise infringing on Congress's turf. 
States are also subject to some of the same restrictions as the federal government. Uh, They can't create nobility, impose ex post facto laws, and so on. Moving on, the next section is about the powers of the president, and it's a lot shorter. Quote, The executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States of America. He shall hold his office during the term of four years, and together with the vice president, chosen for the same term, be elected as follows. End quote. And then the next few paragraphs go over the method of electing the president, which has been tweaked a few times over the years. Basically, it's another compromise with a hybrid system called the Electoral College. And instead of voting directly for president, Americans vote for electors to represent their state, and the electors vote for president. And in turn, each state has a certain number of electors based on its population. And that satisfies the Federalists because it apportions votes equally across the United States. However... Each state also receives two electors simply by virtue of being a state. This corresponds to the state's two senators, and it satisfies the anti-federalists because it acknowledges that this is a union of states, and each state gets to have a say. What's interesting is that both sides want to keep Congress out of choosing the president, so there's no serious movement for a parliamentary-type system. This is based on what we call the separation of powers, or the idea that the executive and legislative branches of government have their own spheres of influence. If the president can just be recalled by Congress at any time, he's not independent, he's more like a prime minister. Now, while the president is independent of Congress and can act more or less as he wishes, his powers are to be strictly limited. Quote, The President shall be Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States and of the Militia of the several states when called into the actual service of the United States. He may require the opinion in writing of the Principal Officer in each of the Executive Departments upon any subject relating to the duties of their respective offices. And he shall have power to grant reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States except in cases of impeachment." End quote. And then, going out of order a little bit, quote, He shall from time to time give to the Congress information of the State of the Union and recommend to their consideration such measures as he shall judge necessary and expedient. He may, on extraordinary occasions, convene both houses or either of them, and in case of disagreement between them, with respect to the time of adjournment, he may adjourn them to such time as he shall think proper. He shall receive ambassadors and other public ministers. He shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed, and shall commission all the officers of the United States. End quote. That's it. And if all of these things sound like administrative duties, you're right. The founders recognized the efficiency of having a single leader, but a single leader, even an elected one, can hardly represent an entire nation. So they delegate policy-making power to Congress and leave the president to simply enact and administer those policies. And when the president does make policy, he does so with congressional oversight. Quote, He shall have power by and with the advice and consent of the Senate, to make treaties, provided two-thirds of the senators present concur, and he shall nominate, and by and with the advice and consent of the Senate, shall appoint ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, judges of the Supreme Court, and all other officers of the United States, whose appointments are not herein otherwise provided for, and which shall be established by law. But the Congress may by law vest the appointment of such inferior officers as they think proper, in the President alone, in the courts of law, or in the heads of departments. End quote. So the President can do a bunch of stuff like make treaties, appoint judges, and choose their cabinet members, but all of this is subject to 
Congressional Review. It's interesting to note that none of these things are subject to review by the House of Representatives, though. They're only approved by the Senate, which represents the states. So it's the states, not the people, who agree to treaties as well as approve judges and other federal officials. And again, this isn't an episode on American civics, but it goes to illustrate how the founders envisioned their government, as well as who we the people are. Is someone from Virginia first a Virginian and second a U.S. citizen, or is it the other way around? This is a question people have spilled blood over. It makes a difference. And I will also point out that the nature and makeup of the rest of the executive branch of the government is left intentionally vague. The Constitution only talks about the president and the vice president. It does not establish any cabinet departments. It simply assumes that positions like Secretary of State and Secretary of the Treasury will exist. And this makes sense when you remember that the U.S. system is an outgrowth of the British system. Yes, the revolution changes many aspects of that system, but it still carries with it some assumptions. In this case, the assumption that the chief executive will have a cabinet that oversees government departments. After this, the Constitution describes the process for impeaching a president, before describing the role of the third branch of government, the judicial branch. This branch is made up of the courts, and it gets even shorter shrift in the Constitution than the executive branch. Quote, The judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one supreme court, and in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. The judges, both of the supreme and inferior courts, shall hold their offices during good behavior, and shall at stated times receive for their services a compensation which shall not be diminished during their continuance in office. So we're going to have federal courts, The judges will be appointed for life as long as they behave themselves. And then the Constitution goes on to outline the power of these courts. And I'm going to skip this whole part because none of it is relevant to our conversation except to point out that Americans have the right to a trial by jury in all criminal trials. Now we come to Article 4 of the U.S. Constitution, and this is the most important part, in my opinion, because it's where the Federalists really win the battle over how this new country is going to be set up. Quote, Full faith and credit shall be given in each state to the public acts, records, and judicial proceedings of every other state, and the Congress may by general laws prescribe the manner in which such acts, records, and proceedings shall be proved in the effect thereof. End quote. We've been over this. It's the full faith and credit clause again. Contracts and court judgments that are valid in one state are valid in all. Quote, The citizens of each state shall be entitled to all privileges and immunities of citizens in the several states. End quote. Alexander Hamilton, everyone's favorite Federalist, would call this clause the basis of the Union. It guarantees that citizenship rights are universal across the states. For example, Pennsylvania can't make it illegal for people from Connecticut to buy land or own a business in Pennsylvania, uh, even moving to Pennsylvania and living there and voting in the elections. For example. Moving on, quote, A person charged in any state with treason, felony, or other crime who shall flee from justice and be found in another state shall on demand of the executive authority of the state from which he fled be delivered up to be removed to the state having jurisdiction of the crime. End quote. This is the flip side of the last clause. Just as citizens have the same basic rights and freedoms across all states, 
they also can't run across state lines to escape justice. At least in theory. Quote, No person held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof, escaping into another, shall, in consequence of any law or regulation therein, be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. End quote. This is another one of those uncomfortable clauses that's talking about slavery. To be fair, it's also talking about escaped indentured servants, but it's mostly about slavery. So if a slave escapes in Georgia and gets to New York, they're still not safe, because if their former master, or more likely a bounty hunter, comes after them, the New York authorities are required to hand them over. That's why the Underground Railroad has to sneak escaped slaves all the way to Canada. As long as those individuals are inside the United States, they remain at risk of being recaptured. Moving on, quote, New states may be admitted by the Congress into this union, but no new state shall be formed or erected within the jurisdiction of any other state nor any state be formed by the junction of two or more states or parts of states without the consent of the legislatures of the states concerned as well as of the Congress, end quote. So there's not going to be any funny business with states dividing, combining, or swapping territory, at least not without Congress giving their blessing. Quote, the Congress shall have power to dispose of and make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory or other property belonging to the United States, and nothing in this Constitution shall be so construed as to prejudice any claims of the United States or of any particular state. End quote. This is a broad power because it gives Congress near total authority over federally owned land. It's under this clause, for example, that Congress is able to maintain the national parks. Congress can also lease federally owned land and resources for money, a practice that continues to this day. Quote, The United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a republican form of government, and shall protect each of them against invasion. And on application of the legislature or of the executive, when the legislature cannot be convened against domestic violence. End quote. There are three things going on in this clause. First, every state in the U.S. is going to have an elected government. There are to be no monarchies, or other non-elective systems. Second, the federal government promises to protect all of the states, which makes it responsible for national defense. Third, the federal government promises to put down local uprisings if any state calls for help. This is specifically to put in the Constitution because of Shays Rebellion to Make sure nothing like that happens again. Combined, these three things make the federal government the supreme power in the land. I've said this before, but go back to Political Science 101 and the definition of a state is an entity with a monopoly on the use of force. Well, here the federal government promises to put down rebellions, repel foreign invaders, and presumably overthrow state governments if a state adopts a non-democratic system of government. By definition, the Federalists have won the debate with this clause alone. Article 6 of the Constitution makes this even more explicit when it says, quote, This Constitution and the laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance thereof and all treaties made, or which shall be made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby, anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary, notwithstanding. End quote. 
as long as it stays within the bounds of the Constitution, anything Congress does supersedes anything done by the states. Period. End of sentence. And that's pretty much all there is to the U.S. Constitution. You know, besides all the technical details I skipped and ignoring almost 250 years of case law that fleshes everything out. At the time, this new Constitution is controversial. Things actually get pretty heated during the signing. At one point... Massachusetts Federalist Francis Dana gets into a fist fight with fellow Massachusetts representative and anti-federalist Elbridge Gary. The anti-federalists threaten to walk out, and several actually do. But two of the most prominent anti-federalists, Samuel Adams and John Hancock, agree on something for once in their lives and decide to sign the Constitution, which is ultimately ratified by all of the states. In return for signing the Constitution, Adams and Hancock had insisted that Congress would then vote on 12 changes, or amendments, to the Constitution. Ten of these amendments are approved, and they come to be known as the Bill of Rights. Now, the Bill of Rights itself is controversial, but not because anyone thinks American citizens don't deserve these rights. Instead, many Federalists, including Alexander Hamilton, believe that the creation of a Bill of Rights will imply that those are the only rights that people have. Hamilton argues that by only granting specific powers to Congress— the president and the federal courts, the Constitution has implicitly left all other powers to the states or to the people. In other words, the people automatically have rights because the Constitution does not explicitly authorize the government to violate them. He also worries that a Bill of Rights could inadvertently lead Congress to claim powers it was not intended to have. He writes, quote, why declare that things shall not be done which there is no power to do? Why, for instance, should it be said that the liberty of the press shall not be restrained when no power is given by which restrictions may be imposed? I will not contend that such a provision would confer a regulating power, but it is evident that it would furnish to men disposed to usurp a plausible pretense for claiming that power. They might urge with a semblance of reason that the Constitution ought not to be charged with the absurdity of providing against the abuse of an authority which was not given, and that the provision against restraining the liberty of the press afforded a clear implication that a power to prescribe proper regulations concerning it was intended to be vested in the national government. End quote. Thomas Jefferson gives perhaps the strongest argument in favor of the Bill of Rights. Quote, Rightful liberty is unobstructed action according to our will within limits drawn around us by the equal rights of others. I do not add within the limits of the law, because law is often but the tyrant's will, and always so when it violates the rights of the individual. End quote. In other words, there must be prescribed limits around what the law can and cannot do, and those limits must coincide with individual rights. It's tough to state how novel a concept this is at the time, and I want to look at the Bill of Rights now, and there's a reason for this. See, the U.S. Bill of Rights will inspire another document, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen, which will be enacted by the French Revolutionary government and which will inspire many, many other similar documents in turn. We'll be going over the French Revolutionary period very soon here on the show, and while these two documents are different in some fundamental ways, there are also some important similarities. So let's take a look at the Bill of Rights and then 
Um, in a few episodes, we will have a chance to highlight some of those similarities and differences. As with the rest of the Constitution, let's take the Bill of Rights piece by piece. Quote, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. End quote. And this might sound like a grab bag of rights, but you could argue that all of the rights contained in this First Amendment boil down to one, the right to share ideas. Freedom of religion is the most personal aspect of this right, akin to freedom of thought. Uh, it relates to the relationship between a person and their deity. Freedom of speech and the press extend this to other human beings. If you're allowed to hold a belief, you're allowed to share it with other people, and people are allowed to exchange ideas without Congress playing referee as to which ideas are good and which are bad. Finally, the rights to assemble and to petition the government constitute a right to take your ideas into the public square, without which the right to a representative government is meaningless. Moving on, quote, A well-regulated militia, being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. End quote. This is a thorny one that I wish weren't as controversial as it is. Interpretations range from you have the right to own an 18th century musket to you have the right to own a nuclear bomb the courts have been inconsistent. Regardless of your position, this one probably ought to be revised since the U.S. hasn't relied on a militia for national defense for over a hundred years. Moving on, quote, No soldier shall, in time of peace, be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. End quote. The Third Amendment is one of those historical oddities that's purely a reflection of its time. If you remember from previous episodes, one of the things that angered early American revolutionaries was the stationing of British redcoats in people's homes. So, for these people, it makes sense to write down that the government can't do this. For a modern person, on the other hand, it sounds almost silly, like making an amendment that says Congress can't force people to wear top hats. Why would the army want to use my house as a barracks anyway? Why is this in there? Uh, this is why. Sometimes the past really is like an alien planet. Continuing. Quote, The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. End quote. The Fourth Amendment is an outgrowth of contemporary British law under which most searches require a legal writ issued by a judge. This just ensures that Congress can't go and waive that requirement sometime in the future. Moving on, quote, No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arriving in the land or naval forces or in the militia, when in actual service in time of war or public danger. Nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb, nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, 
nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. End quote. The Fifth Amendment is pretty broad, but it all has to do with the right to due process. In other words, if the government wants to prosecute you for a crime or punish you in some way, they have to do it by the book. Furthermore, if prosecutors even want to accuse you of a serious crime, they first need to present evidence to a grand jury and secure an indictment. This is meant to keep public officials from harassing people with constant made-up criminal charges. Continuing, quote, in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law, and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor, and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense." End quote. This is more stuff about criminal law, and by the way, most of these rights are not American innovations so much as they are the traditional rights of free British citizens, but they're rights that the Founding Fathers feel that they have been denied in the past by the British Empire, and so they put them into writing to keep that from happening again. Continuing, quote, In suits at common law, where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved, and no fact tried by a jury shall be otherwise re-examined in any court of the United States than according to the rules of the common law. End quote. The Constitution already guarantees the right to trial by jury in criminal trials, and the Seventh Amendment extends that right to civil trials for most cases. Although, it would probably make sense to update that $20 limit given 250 years of inflation, but anyway, continuing, uh, quote, "...excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed." nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. The Eighth Amendment always amuses me a little because it's supposed to be about protecting specific rights. But then it uses words like excessive, cruel, and unusual, all of which are subject to interpretation and have been interpreted many different ways over the years. The definitions of these words have changed over time, and people will go down rabbit holes debating each of them. Continuing, quote, The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. End quote. The Ninth Amendment addresses Alexander Hamilton's concern that a Bill of Rights will erode people's other freedoms. For example, there is no constitutional right to privacy, but it's traditionally been considered a right nonetheless, and courts have upheld that. Continuing, quote, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. End quote. The Tenth Amendment is a corollary to the Ninth, and it's pretty self-explanatory. Rights and political power both stem from the people first and foremost. Popular sovereignty again. At the outset, it's not at all obvious how this new government will function. Congress has been meeting for a while now, but the Senate is a new institution, and the role of the president has barely even been defined. The man who will ultimately define it is none other than George Washington. 
The general who had led the Continental Army through so many difficulties will now face the task of leading an entire country. Following the end of the war, Washington had returned to Virginia and spent the next few years making his estate profitable again. He'd borrowed huge sums of money during the Revolution and will spend most of the rest of his life paying off creditors. When the Constitutional Convention was called, Washington had traveled to Philadelphia, where he was elected president of the convention. He mostly stayed quiet during the debates, using his position only to restore order when the delegates argued too loudly. In the convention's aftermath, George Washington became a full-throated nationalist, at one time stating that blood would run in the streets if the Constitution were not ratified. He even gives procedural advice to some Maryland Federalists who are working to get their state to ratify the Constitution. Washington being from Virginia, his involvement upset some Maryland anti-Federalists, but even his opponents rarely dare to criticize him publicly. The 1789 presidential election is the only such election in American history to be more or less uncontested. While Washington doesn't officially run for president, joins no political party, and operates no campaign, he makes it clear that he will serve if elected. Nobody dares to run against him, and the Electoral College elects him in a unanimous vote, another unique event. It's worth noting that at the time of the election, North Carolina and Rhode Island have not yet ratified the Constitution, and New York chooses its electors too late for them to participate. Not that it matters. The voting population votes more than 90% in favor of Federalist electors, and while those electors differ in their choice for vice president, all of them agree that Washington is the man for the top job. In his first few months as president, Washington oversees the ratification of the Bill of Rights, the establishment of the federal court system, and he signs into law a 5% tax on all imports. He also offers to serve as president for free, but Congress wisely votes the president a salary of $25,000 a year, ensuring that the presidency is not reserved for people who can afford to be unemployed. As an administrator, George Washington remains intimately involved with the War Department and State Department, which makes sense because he's a military man with some experience in foreign relations. By contrast, he leaves the Treasury Department to his Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, over whom he exercises nearly zero oversight. In his book, the Ascent of George Washington, the Hidden Political Genius of an American Icon, American historian John Furling writes, quote, Hamilton knew that the Treasury Department would be the cockpit of decisions made in that department would determine much about the shape of America, the lives of Americans, and the nature of American politics. By holding the post, moreover, Hamilton would be catapulted to the top rung of power in New York City which was dominated by financial and mercantile interests. He also expected to have a free hand at Treasury. Washington was not an economist. He had, in fact, recently confessed that he was so little conversant in public securities of every kind as not to know the use or value of them, and hardly the difference of one species from another. Hamilton was blessed with every quality Washington wanted in his Treasury secretary. Fluent and persuasive, unequaled in guile and political dexterity, Hamilton was renowned for his heroic capacity for work. But Washington was drawn to Hamilton for still other reasons. No one was ever a better judge of others than Washington, and he had sufficient experience with Hamilton to fathom his character to its very core. Daily, at headquarters during the war, Washington had witnessed every side there was to Hamilton. He had beheld Hamilton the dreamer, 
menacing intriguer, creative polemicist, insightful statesman, brilliant economist, and relentless avenger. Washington nominated Hamilton in September. The Senate rapidly consented, after which Congress directed the Treasury Secretary to present a plan for solving the nation's economic ills within 100 days. Hamilton met his deadline, tendering his grand plan on January 14, 1790, a date that might be considered the moment the cornerstone was laid for the modern United States. Hamilton's report did something else as well. What the Treasury Secretary proposed turned out to be the launching pad for the incendiary partisanship that swept the nation during the supervening decade. End quote. And what Furling is talking about here is Alexander Hamilton's plan to establish a national bank. This national bank will fund the United States government via long-term low-interest loans that appeal to investors who want the security of a low-risk, low-reward investment. Hamilton also proposes that the federal government take on the debts that the various states have incurred during the Revolution. Washington's Secretary of State, Thomas Jefferson, is opposed to this measure, believing that a federal government that's powerful enough to assume state debts is too powerful for the states to maintain their rights. But Jefferson has spent most of the last several years in France serving as ambassador, and he doesn't have the same up-to-date political connections as Hamilton, so Hamilton ends up getting his way. And the United States assumes the war debt of the 13 original colonies. Hamilton's plan requires additional taxes to cover the interest on the national debt. To make these payments, he proposes a tax on distilled spirits. But the way the tax is imposed, it falls mostly on the smaller distillers in Appalachia and the western frontier. These distillers already have a hard time. They only produce whiskey in the first place because of transportation costs. These people all live far inland, and shipping a wagon load of corn from Appalachia to the eastern seaports is so expensive that the transportation costs eat up all of your profits. So, instead of shipping their grain... Farmers instead have set up small stills and they are making whiskey, which is far more valuable per pound and will still sell for a profit when shipped over long distances. Well, Hamilton's plan is to tax them based on the capacity of their stills, while taxing larger producers a flat rate per gallon produced. The long and short of it is that this will wipe out any profit the small Appalachian producers are making while ensuring that industrial distilleries stay in business and provide opportunities for investment. Uh, This is intentional, by the way. Hamilton believes that in order to be successful, the United States needs to be an industrial country, and that means centralizing production in large factories. But... The back country has been the hotbed of anti-federalism already, so it looks like George Washington's administration is taking political revenge on people who didn't vote for him. Thomas Jefferson warns Washington about the whiskey tax, arguing that it forces some of society's poorest members to finance a business system in which they have no stake. But he is once again ignored, and the tax goes into effect in 1791. Jefferson proves to be correct in anticipating backlash, and tax revenues are well below forecast because people are simply not paying. In fact, there are no taxes collected at all in Kentucky or western Pennsylvania. And this goes on until 1794. Now, by this point, Washington is in his second term, having unanimously won a contested second election against New York Governor George Clinton. On July 16th of that year, uh, 1794, a group of militiamen from Mingo Creek, Pennsylvania, attack the house of John Neville, who is the regional tax collector and a former Revolutionary War general. 
While Neville and members of his household are able to repel the attack and even shoot two of the attackers dead, this is an escalation that the federal government cannot tolerate. It's a repetition of Shays' Rebellion, except it threatens to break out on a national scale. Washington calls his cabinet together to deliberate. Alexander Hamilton urges a military response, and Washington agrees. On September 30th, George Washington leaves Philadelphia, once again leading a column of troops and wearing his army uniform. He oversees the formation of the army, but leaves the actual leadership to Henry Lee, who marches into western Pennsylvania. Washington also offers general amnesty to any tax rebels who surrender, and most of them do, so Henry Lee only ends up arresting 150 men, and only 20 are actually prosecuted. Of these... Two are convicted of treason, and Washington pardons both of them. While his image had initially suffered from the whiskey tax, his peaceful resolution of the rebellion wins him broad approval once again. In his sixth State of the Union address on November 19, 1794, Washington would tell Congress, quote, while there is cause to lament that occurrences of this nature should have disgraced the name or interrupted the tranquility of any part of our community, or should have diverted to a new application any portion of the public resources, there are not wanting real and substantial consolations for the misfortune. It is demonstrated that our prosperity rests on solid foundations— by furnishing an additional that my fellow citizens understand the true principles of government and liberty, that they feel their interest and duty, they are not as ready to maintain the authority of the laws against licentious invasions as they were to defend their rights against usurpation. It has been a spectacle displaying to the highest advantage of republican government to behold the most and least wealthy of our citizens standing in the same ranks as private soldiers, preeminently distinguished by being the army of the Constitution, undeterred by a march of 300 miles over rugged mountains, by approach of an inclement season, or by any other discouragement. Nor ought I to omit to acknowledge the efficacious and patriotic cooperation which I have experienced from the chief magistrates of the states to which my requisitions have been addressed. To every description of citizens, let praise be given. But let them persevere in their affectionate vigilance over that precious depository of American happiness, the Constitution of the United States. Let them cherish it, too for the sake of those who, from every clime, are daily seeking a dwelling in our land. And when, in the calm moments of reflection, they shall have retraced the origin and progress of the insurrection, let them determine whether it has not been fomented by combinations of men who, careless of consequences and disregarding the unerring truth that those who rouse cannot always appease a civil convulsion, have disseminated from an ignorance or perversion of facts, suspicions, jealousies, and accusations of the whole government. Having thus fulfilled the engagement which I took when I entered into office, to the best of my ability to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States, on you, gentlemen, and the people by whom you are deputed, I rely for support. End quote. The Whiskey Rebellion has reaffirmed the existence of the United States not just as a federation of states, but also as a unitary country. This hybrid system will form the basis for American political life, both for good and for ill, for the years to come. In the best of times, it has allowed the states to serve as laboratories for democracy, as they say testing out new ideas that other states have copied. In the worst of times, this system has provided ammunition for a bloody civil war. Perhaps George Washington's 
greatest gift to the United States is the way in which he conducts himself. Because once again, he, more than anyone else, gets to define the office of the president. He foregoes the opportunity to wear robes or a crown or other traditional symbols of power. These are all things that had been suggested, by the way. Alexander Hamilton was a big fan of crowns and thrones, as long as they were American. Instead, Washington wears nice clothes of the kind a successful landowner might wear. And this has remained the tradition throughout all of American history, with modern presidents opting for a simple business suit. Indeed, it's a common practice for heads of government in every democratic country I can think of in modern times. To be fair, George Washington walks a fine line between royalty and the everyday citizen. He makes himself available to his subordinates only on Tuesdays and hosts fancy dinners every Thursday where he greets guests with a bow rather than a handshake. Other than that and intermittent tours of the country, Washington spends most of his time in his office hoping to maintain an air of mystique around the presidency. But he also chooses a humble title, opting to be addressed as Mr. President, rather than something more regal like Your Majesty. By using the title Mr., Washington is emphasizing his status as a citizen, rather than as a ruler who looks down from on high. Perhaps Washington's most enduring choice is his choice to voluntarily give up power after two terms in office. In the fall of 1796, he announces that he will not stand for a third term, and he steps down in March of 1797 when he attends the inauguration of John Adams, who had served as his vice president for eight years and who had been the man to nominate him as commander-in-chief of the Continental Army in the first place. Because of this, George Washington is often compared to Lucius Quintius Cincinnatus, the ancient Roman consul who served as a dictator not once but twice to save his city in the time of peril, and both times Cincinnatus returned to his farm afterwards rather than hold on to the dictatorship. Washington's farewell address remains one of the most famous in American history. He begins by thanking the American people for electing him twice as president and announcing his retirement. Then he says, quote, Here, perhaps, I ought to stop. But a solicitude for your welfare, which cannot end but with my life, and the apprehension of danger natural to that solicitude, urge me, on an occasion like the present, to offer to your solemn contemplation and to recommend to your frequent review some sentiments which are the result of much reflection, of no inconsiderable observation, and which appear to me all important to the permanency of your felicity as a people. These will be offered to you with the more freedom, as you can only see in them the disinterested warnings of a parting friend, who can possibly have no personal motive to bias in his counsel. Nor can I forget, as an encouragement to it, your indulgent reception of my sentiments on a former and not dissimilar occasion. Interwoven as is the love of liberty with every ligament of your hearts, no recommendation of mine is necessary to fortify or confirm the attachment. The unity of government, which constitutes you, one people, is also now dear to you. It is justly so, for it is a main pillar in the edifice of your real independence, the support of your tranquility at home, your peace abroad, of your safety, of your prosperity, 
of that very liberty which you so highly prize. But as it is easy to foresee that from different causes and from different quarters much pains will be taken, many artifices employed to weaken in your minds the conviction of this truth, as this is the point in your political fortress against which the batteries of internal and external enemies will be most constantly and actively, though often covertly and insidiously directed, it is of infinite moment that you should properly estimate the immense value of your national union to your collective and individual happiness, that you should cherish a cordial, habitual, and immovable attachment to it, accustoming yourselves to think and speak of it as of the palladium of your political safety and prosperity, watching for its preservation with jealous anxiety, discountenancing whatever may suggest even a suspicion that it can in any event be abandoned, and indignantly frowning upon the first dawning of every attempt to alienate any portion of our country from the rest, or to enfeeble the sacred ties which now link together the various parts. For this, you have every inducement of sympathy and interest. Citizens, by birth or choice, of a common country, that country has a right to concentrate your affections. The name of American, which belongs to you, in your national capacity, must always exalt the just pride of patriotism more than any appellation derived from local discriminations. With slight shades of difference, you have the same religion, manners and habits, and political principles. You have in a common cause fought and triumphed together. The independence and liberty you possess are the work of joint councils and joint efforts, of common dangers, sufferings, and successes. But these considerations, however powerfully they address themselves to your sensibility, are greatly outweighed by those which apply more immediately to your interest. Here, every portion of our country finds the most commanding motives for carefully guarding and preserving the union of the whole. The North, in an unrestrained intercourse with the South, protected by the equal laws of a common government, finds in the productions of the latter great additional resources of maritime and commercial enterprise and precious materials of manufacturing industry. The South, in the same intercourse, benefiting by the agency of the North, sees its agriculture grow and its commerce expand. Turning partly into its own channels, the seamen of the North, it finds its particular navigation invigorated. And while it contributes in different ways to nourish and increase the general mass of the national navigation, it looks forward to the protection of a maritime strength to which itself is unequally adapted. The East, in a like intercourse with the West, already finds, and in the progressive improvement of interior communications by land and water, will more and more find a valuable vent for the commodities by which it brings from abroad or manufactures at home. The West derives from the East supplies requisite to its growth and comfort, and, what is perhaps of still greater consequence, it must of necessity owe the secure enjoyment of indispensable outlets for its own productions to the weight, influence, and the future maritime strength of the Atlantic side of the Union, directed by an indissoluble community of interest as one nation. Any other tenure by which the West can hold this essential advantage, whether derived from its own separate strength or from an apostate and unnatural connection with any foreign power, must be intrinsically precarious. While then, every part of our country thus feels an immediate and particular interest in union, all the parts combined cannot fail to find in the united mass of means and efforts greater strength, greater resource, proportionately greater security from external danger, a less frequent interruption of their peace by foreign nations, and what is of inestimable value, they must derive from union an exemption from those broils and wars between themselves, which so frequently afflict neighboring countries not tied together by the same governments, which their own rivalships alone would be sufficient to produce, 
but which opposite foreign alliances, attachments, and intrigues would stimulate and embitter. Hence, likewise, they will avoid the necessity of those overgrown military establishments which, under any form of government, are inauspicious to liberty, and which are to be regarded as particularly hostile to republican liberty. In this sense it is that your union ought to be considered as a main prop of your liberty, and that the love of the one ought to endear you to the preservation of the other. End quote. So, he's saying that the union of the states is beneficial to everyone, and individual states are bound to fail without the help of the others. After continuing along these lines for a couple of minutes, Washington then says, quote, To the efficacy and permanency of your union, a government for the whole is indispensable. No alliances, however strict, between the parts can be an adequate substitute. They must inevitably experience the infractions and interruptions which all alliances in all times have experienced. Sensible of this momentous truth, you have improved upon your first essay by the adoption of a constitution of government better calculated than your former for an intimate union and for the efficacious management of your common concerns. This government the offspring of our own choice, uninfluenced and unawed, adopted upon full investigation and mature deliberation, completely free in its principles, in the distribution of its powers, uniting security with energy, and containing within itself a provision for its own amendment, has a just claim to your confidence and your support. Respect for its authority, compliance with its laws, Acquiescence in its measures are duties enjoined by the fundamental maxims of true liberty. The basis of our political systems is the right of the people to make and to alter their constitutions of government. But the constitution, which at any time exists, till changed by an explicit and authentic act of the whole people, is sacredly obligatory upon all. The very idea of the power and the right of the people to establish government presupposes the duty of every individual to obey the established government. All obstructions to the execution of the laws, all combinations and associations, under whatever plausible character, with the real design to direct, control, counteract, or awe the regular deliberation and action of the constituted authorities, are destructive of this fundamental principle, and of fatal tendency. They serve to organize faction, to give it an artificial and extraordinary force, to put, in the place of the delegated will of the nation, the will of a party, often a small but artful and enterprising minority of the community, and, according to the alternate triumphs of different parties, to make the public administration the mirror of the ill-concerted and incongruous projects of faction rather than the organ of consistent and wholesome plans digested by common councils and modified by mutual interests. However combinations or associations of the above description may now and then answer popular ends, they are likely, in the course of time and things, to become potent engines by which cunning, ambitious, and unprincipled men will be enabled to subvert the power of the people and to usurp for themselves the reins of government, destroying afterwards the very engines which have lifted them to unjust dominion. Towards the preservation of your government, and the permanency of your present happy state, it is requisite not only that you steadily discountenance irregular oppositions to its acknowledged authority, but also that you resist with care the spirit of innovation upon its principles, however specious the pretexts. One method of assault may be to effect, in the forms of the Constitution, alterations which will impair the energy of the system, and thus to undermine what cannot be directly overthrown. In all the changes to which you may be invited, remember that time and habit are at least as necessary to fix the true character of governments as of other human institutions. 
that experience is the surest standard by which to test the real tendency of the existing constitution of a country, that facility in changes upon the credit of mere hypothesis and opinion exposes to perpetual change from the endless variety of hypothesis and opinion, and remember especially that for the efficient management of our common interests in a country so extensive as ours, a government of as much vigor as is consistent with the perfect security of liberty is indispensable. Liberty itself will find in such a government, with powers properly distributed and adjusted, its surest guardian. It is indeed little else than a name, where the government is too feeble to withstand the enterprises of faction, to confine each member of the society within the limits prescribed by the laws, and to maintain all in the secure and tranquil enjoyment of the rights of person and property. End quote. Washington is arguing that a robust federal government is a good thing because it guarantees freedom for everybody. A weak federal government, on the other hand, would lead to some states dominating others. He then goes on to give a famous warning. Quote, I have already intimated to you the danger of parties in the state, with particular reference to the founding of them on geographical discriminations. Let me now take a more comprehensive view, and warn you in the most solemn manner against the baneful effects of the spirit of party generally. This spirit, unfortunately, is inseparable from our nature, having its root in the strongest passions of the human mind. It exists under different shapes in all governments, more or less stifled, controlled, or repressed, but in those of the popular form, it is seen in its greatest rankness and is truly their worst enemy. The alternate domination of one faction over another, sharpened by the spirit of revenge, natural to a party dissension, which in different ages and countries has perpetuated the most horrid enormities, is itself a frightful despotism. But this leads at length to a more formal and permanent despotism. The disorders and miseries which result gradually incline the minds of men to seek security and repose in the absolute power of an individual. And sooner or later, the chief of some prevailing faction more able or more fortunate than his competitors, turns this disposition to the purposes of his own elevation, on the ruins of public liberty. Without looking forward to an extremity of this kind, which nevertheless ought not to be entirely out of sight, the common and continual mischiefs of the spirit of party are sufficient to make it the interest and duty of a wise people to discourage and restrain it. It serves always to distract the public councils and enfeeble the public administration. It agitates the community with ill-founded jealousies and false alarms, kindles the animosity of one part against another, foments occasionally riot and insurrection. It opens the door to foreign influence and corruption, which find a facilitated access to the government itself through the channels of party passions. Thus, the policy and the will of one country are subjected to the policy and will of another. There is an opinion that parties in free countries are useful checks upon the administration of the government and serve to keep alive the spirit of liberty. This, within certain limits, is probably true. And in governments of a monarchical caste, patriotism may look with indulgence, if not with favor, upon the spirit of party. But in those of the popular character, in governments purely elective, it is a spirit not to be encouraged. From their natural tendency, it is certain there will always be enough of that spirit for every salutary purpose. And there being constant danger of excess, the effort ought to be, by force of public opinion, to mitigate and assuage it. A fire not to be quenched, it demands a uniform vigilance to prevent it bursting into a flame, lest instead of warming, it should consume. End quote. 
So political parties are bad because people will stop thinking of the national interest in favor of their own narrower interests. He then goes on to urge Americans to uphold the separation of powers between branches of government, uphold their religious traditions, and promote widespread education. Washington even has something to say in favor of taxes. Quote, The execution of these maxims belongs to your representatives, but it is necessary that public opinion should cooperate. To facilitate to them the performance of their duty, it is essential that you should practically bear in mind that towards the payment of debt there must be revenue, that to have revenue there must be taxes, that no taxes can be devised which are not more or less inconvenient and unpleasant. End quote. And following this, George Washington gives his most famous warning of all, a warning against getting too involved in foreign affairs. Quote, Observe good faith and justice towards all nations. Cultivate peace and harmony with all. Religion and morality enjoin this conduct, and can it be that good policy does not equally enjoin it? It will be worthy of a free, enlightened, and at no distant period a great nation to give to mankind the magnanimous and too novel example of a people always guided by an exalted justice and benevolence. Who can doubt that in the course of time and things, the fruits of such a plan would richly repay any temporary advantages which might be lost by a steady adherence to it? Can it be that providence has not connected the permanent felicity of a nation with its virtue? The experiment, at least, is recommended by every sentiment which ennobles human nature. Alas, is it rendered impossible by its vices? In the execution of such a plan, nothing is more essential than that permanent and veterate antipathies against particular nations and passionate attachments for others should be excluded, and that in place of them, just and amicable feelings towards all should be cultivated. The nation which indulges towards another a habitual hatred or a habitual fondness is in some degree a slave. It is a slave to its animosity or to its affection, either of which is sufficient to lead it astray from its duty and its interest. Antipathy in one nation against another disposes each more readily to offer insult and injury to lay hold of slight causes of umbrage, and to be haughty and intractable when accidental or trifling occasions of dispute occur. Hence frequent collisions, obstinate, envenomed, and bloody contests. The nation, prompted by ill will and resentment, sometimes impels to war the government, contrary to the best calculations of policy. The government sometimes participates in the national propensity and adopts through passion what reason would reject. At other times, it makes the animosity of the nation subservient to projects of hostility instigated by pride, ambition, and other sinister and pernicious motives. The peace often, sometimes perhaps the liberty of nations, has been the victim. So likewise, a passionate attachment of one nation for another produces a variety of evils. Sympathy for the favorite nation, facilitating the illusion of an imaginary common interest in cases where no real common interest exists, and infusing into one the enmities of the other, betrays the former into a participation in the quarrels and wars of the latter, without adequate inducement or justification. It leads also to concessions to the favorite nation of privileges denied to others, which is apt doubly to injure the nation making the concessions, by unnecessarily parting with what ought to have been retained, and by exciting jealousy, ill will, and a disposition to retaliate in the parties from whom equal privileges are withheld. And it gives to ambitious, corrupted, or deluded citizens who devote themselves to the favorite nation facility to betray or sacrifice the interests of their own country without odium 
sometimes even with popularity, gilding with the appearances of a virtuous sense of obligation, a commendable deference for public opinion, or a laudable zeal for public good, the base or foolish compliances of ambition, corruption, or infatuation. As avenues to foreign influence in innumerable ways, such attachments are particularly alarming to the truly enlightened and independent patriot. How many opportunities do they afford to tamper with domestic factions, to practice the arts of seduction, to mislead public opinion, to influence or awe the public councils? Such an attachment of a small or weak towards a great or powerful nation dooms the former to be the satellite of the latter. Against the insidious wiles of foreign influence, I conjure you to believe me, fellow citizens, the jealousy of a free people ought to be constantly awake. Since history and experience prove that foreign influence is one of the most baneful foes of Republican government. But that jealousy, to be useful, must be impartial. Else it becomes the instrument of the very influence to be avoided, instead of a defense against it. Excessive partiality for one foreign nation and excessive dislike of another cause those whom they actuate to see danger only on one side and serve to veil and even second the arts of influence on the other. Real patriots, who may resist the intrigues of the favorite, are liable to become suspected and odious, while its tools and dupes usurp the applause and confidence of the people to surrender their interests. The great rule of conduct for us, in regard to foreign nations, is in extending our commercial relations, to have with them as little political connection as possible. So far as we have already formed engagements, let them be fulfilled with perfect good faith. Here, let us stop. Europe has a set of primary interests, which to us have none, or a very remote, relation. Hence, she must be engaged in frequent controversies, the causes of which are essentially foreign to our concerns. Hence, therefore, it must be unwise in us to implicate ourselves by artificial ties in the ordinary vicissitudes of her politics, or the ordinary combinations and collisions of her friendships or enmities. Our detached and distant situation invites and enables us to pursue a different course. If we remain one people, under an efficient government, the period is not far off when we may defy material injury from external annoyance, when we may take such an attitude as will cause the neutrality we may at any time resolve upon to be scrupulously respected when belligerent nations, under the impossibility of making acquisitions upon us, will not lightly hazard the giving us provocation, when we may choose peace or war as our interest, guided by justice, shall counsel. Why forego the advantages of so peculiar a situation? Why quit our own to stand upon foreign ground? Why, by interweaving our destiny with that of any part of Europe, entangle our peace and prosperity with the toils of European ambition, rivalship, interest, humor, or caprice? End quote. Washington is not blowing smoke here. As he is giving his address, the French Revolution is raging in Europe and Britain and France are at war. So far, under Washington's leadership, the United States has managed to remain uninvolved. This will establish an American tradition of non-intervention in foreign affairs that will continue until the early 20th century. But non-intervention does not mean non-involvement and the American Revolution has already impacted world affairs. The American system is based on Enlightenment ideals, imported not just from Britain but from France. With the American Revolution, 
a few scrappy North Americans have established the world's first large-scale modern democracy. Now, those Enlightenment ideals of government are propagating back across the Atlantic to France, where revolutionary armies are overturning Europe's most powerful monarchy. The American revolutionaries have ignited a spark that is about to change the world. And that's why it's relevant. Hey everybody, it's Dan again, and I'm here to remind you that if you're only listening to relevant history, you're not getting all of my content. Every month, I release a video episode of a series called Dan's War College. This series covers historical battles, military units, weapons, trends, and other military-related topics, and you can get access to it for $5 a month on Patreon. In addition to access to the video series, patrons also get access to a private Discord channel for members only, and I do take episode requests from patrons. If you're interested in that and in supporting the show, which I very much appreciate, the Patreon link is in the description. Of course, there are other ways to support the show as well, the easiest is simply to share it with your friends, share it on social media, on Reddit, and on other platforms where people are looking for podcast recommendations. The audience grows by word of mouth, and every little bit helps. You'll also notice links to most of my sources in the episode description. These links allow you to buy the various books I have used for relevant history and read the complete story for yourself. And the neat thing about these links is that they are affiliate links, so at no extra cost to you, I get a small percentage of what you spend on the book you were going to buy anyway. So it's a win-win scenario, and it helps the show. Finally, if you want to get in touch with me, you can reach out on Twitter at Dan Toller Podcast. That's Dan T O L E R Podcast. You can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash Dan Toller Podcast. Or you can send me an email at Dan Toller Podcast at gmail.com. That's Dan T O L E R Podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening.